Honorable Chairperson of BOG, National Institute of Technology, Durgapur, Professor Shadanandu Shadashiv Gokhale. Good morning. Anupam Basu, Director of Chief Director of the Pixel, which is a pilot. of the Oran, Algeria, he went to Nottingham University and was awarded the PhD degree in Honorable Chairperson of BOG, National Institute of Technology, Durgapur, Professor Shadanandu Shadashiv Gokhale, Respected Professor Anupam Basu, Director NIT Durgapur, Respected Professor Ganesh Datta Sharma, Department of Physics of LNM Institute of Information Technology, India, Respected collaborator, Professor Jean Michael Nunji, Queen's University, Canada. Respected collaborator, Professor E. Tamib, uh, Higher School of Economics, Russia. Respected Dr. M. Shoel, Kanaja University, Japan. Respected Dr. Iara Gobato, uh, Federal University of San Carlo, Brazil. Respected Professor Mohammed Henini, University of Nottingham, UK. Respected Professor P. Chakraborty, Director, IST Shippur, India. Respected Professor K. K. Chattopadhyay, Jadavpur University, India. Respected Professor uh, Shubhananda Chakraborty, IIT Bombay, India. And respected professors from other IITs and universities. Dear participants from all corner of the country and different parts of the world, respected colleagues and dear participants. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you at the opening ceremony of the second international webinar on advanced hybrid materials for sustainability, sponsored by the scheme for promotions of academic and research collaborator SPAR. Higher Education Department, Dep uh, Government of India, organized by NIT Durgapur in collaborations with Queen's University, Canada, and in Franklin Institute of Physics, Chemistry, and Electrochemistry, Moscow, Russia, during 2000, uh, 26 to 28 November 2021. In our spare project, our aim was to develop a universal advanced low-cost nanohybrid platform for air pollution, water, and biofluids. Recently, we have developed a titanium dioxide nanowire based fit sensor by physical vapor deposition technique and detected the glucose and heavy metal arsenic at different operating temperature. We have published three reputed SCI journal papers in Ceramic International, Journal of Alloy and Compounds, and Material Science in Semiconductor Processing in 2021 from this project. Two journal papers are communicated and one is under preparation. We are also going to publish a monograph or book very soon with the reputed publishers on hybrid nanostructure as solid state sensor. One PhD student and one NTEC student is working to execute the project. We have organized the first international webinar on 27-8-2020 and 29-8-2020 with 90 participants from different parts of the world. We have conducted many uh, team meetings with the foreigner collaborators to run the project. The third international webinar will be announced soon under this scheme. Also, we shall try to uh, find out some possible ways of movement of the faculties and PhD students with the Queen's University, Canada. All of us are aware that the domain of the hybrid materials are vast and it is a multidisciplinary field, including the knowledge of engineering, physics, chemistry, biotechnology, economics, and policy matters, etc. Pupils around the globe working on the advanced materials have always been concerned about the major challenges that our planet faces right now. It is no secret that climate changes and the deteriorations of environment are perhaps the biggest challenges that uh, humankind has ever faced. There is an urgent need of the world to move towards achieving sustainability and make effort to convert environment. With these great challenges that the world faces, it is absolutely vital that the sphere of the science and the research resolves the brains about solutions for the world to come over these problems. We believe that the right use of modern technology coupled with the optimum to and optimize research can proved to be useful in tackling these problems effectively. As an example, it can be found 
a specific area of interest including the preparations of high capacity composite materials for the selective removal and recovery of heavy metals and as well as the removal of the radio nuclides from the waters and waste waters design of the composite materials with controlled pore dimensions and for, for the selective removal of the organic contaminants or synthesis uh, of modified nanoporous composite materials for the decomposing of specific pollutants with this perspective the objective of the webinar is to explore possible ways of conti continue teaching through the online mode exchange of the knowledge on hybrid materials and their applications in the environment protections of the materials will cover recent progress novelties and important findings regarding these unique materials and keep the students motivated without compromising on the quality of the research and teaching in this context i would uh, i would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues all of whom have been working with us since the beginning of the planning stage and they are still here today in spite of their other responsibilities i would like to extend my thanks to the spark i thankful for supporting us in organizing this program but uh, i would like to convey my sincere gratitude to all the eminent speakers keynote speakers who have committed to make this program a success by incorporating their esteemed presence in this program into their busy schedule finally this is an opportunity uh, appropriate time to me to wish all the participants a fruitful day for this uh, interesting and beneficial program so now i am introducing our honorable chairman dog nit durgapur professor ss gokle professor gokle is first batch aeronautic engineering from iit bombay and did his ms and phd from university of lusons arba champing uh, usa in same discipline after a brief stint as pdf he returned in 1980 and joined iit madras as an assistant professor and worked there till 2003 he served the institute in various capacities including hod's advisor dean students and management uh, uh, representative for iso 9001 strategic planning committee member etc his academic field of special specialization is uh, aircraft and missile propulsions cfd simulations and optimizations and multimedia of engineering educations for r&d and consultancy project professor gokle received funding from isro drdo air and da dv uh, mhrd etc he has published his work in the national and international fronts from 2003 till 2012 professor gokle was Uh, interested with the responsibilities by the MHRD as the director of NIT Kozhikode and Nagpur he was director in charge for NIT Raipur for one year and founding director of NIT Mizoram these institutes becomes institutes of national importance from RSS in 2007 in the initial phase academic restructuring developing additional physical infrastructure uh, restructuring of Uh, restructuring and nurturing human resources faculties and staffs are some of the challenges administrative restructuring and successful implementations of take you 1 and 2 was carried out in 2010 he shouldered the responsibility as the chairman of central council board for the student admissions in nit's cftis from 2012 till 2017 he has he was the director of the lokshmi mission mittal institute of information technology in jaipur first ppp mode deemed to be university in rajasthan professor gokle has served as a member of the working group of engineering segment of national knowledge uh, uh, commissions in 2007 to 2008 as well as on the nit review committee from 2012 to 2014 he is a trained moderator of jup german methodology of methodology for uh, project planning and has carried out number of workshops for public sector as well as government undertakings he is a life member of aero society of india and institute of engineers professor gokle has visited uk germany south korea ireland thailand taiwan 
and use it for professional presentation as well as well as for institutional development he commit uh, he co uh, he continues to teach and guide research scholars until today upon his return to pune from jaipur in july 2017 professor gokhale is monitored um, uh, mentoring and advising a few technical institutes in the capacity as government body government board and academic counseling member he is currently the chairman of board of governor of nit dugapur professor gokhale was an adjacent faculty at defense institute of advanced technology in uh, greenagar pune for one and half year he taught at diat as well as mil it pg courses in space technology as a visiting faculty he taught the bnit nagpur and mit adt pune ug courses in space science and technology he assist as co chair member for drdo rec as well as sac asc of aict now i warmly welcome to our honorable chairperson of bog national institute of technology durgapur professor sadanandu sadashiv gokhale who encouraged us guided us and mentally supported us to organize this webinar for his keynote lecture sir please all right uh, now i hope i am uh, audible and i am also visible so what i am going to do is that in this uh, 20 25 minutes you know i would like to take a deviation from your main theme your main theme is about the sustainability so i am going to talk about the sustainability in the area in which i specialize and that is the aerospace engineering so uh, bear with me and ya aage piche ja gaya okay uh so as far as the aerospace engineering is concerned you know what are the different uh, different uh, type of uh, peculiarities in we have got a large variety of different materials used in an aircraft metals alloys composites rubbers glass plastics elastomers and so on so forth these have to be integrated perfectly because if there is some sort of a gap and so on so forth it will be damaging and it will be disastrous so we need a fail proof operations first time and all the times aerospace science you know has got a very good track record as far as the safety issues are concerned but it has to be done with the perfection in manufacturing with the discipline you know in terms of uh, maintenance life cycle extensions and so on so forth aircraft operates in an atmosphere which varies considerably from uh, sea level conditions you know to 50 kilometers the civilian aircraft you know operate somewhere around 13 14 kilometers but the military aircrafts they can go as high as something like 50 kilometers aircraft uh, uh, this type of a varying type of uh, atmosphere causes a little bit of a stress it is a continuous exposure to the different weather conditions sand dust snow salt humidity that takes a damage you know on the aircraft structures the metals and so on so forth aerospace science develops different products for movement of material from point a to b with utmost safety and reliability so what are aircraft design principles you know this is a large scale system integration you know uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, aerospace is always involved in developing uh, things you know developing products you know. so we have in a typical aircraft you know in a civilian type of aircraft there is a large scale system integration and it has got the extremely low factor of safety there is a minimum redundancy because uh, and that redundancy is only restricted to the critical components you know, it is not across continuous repetitive loads you know which are basically thermal mechanical stress vibration etc these are difficult uh, these are the difficult environment resulting in a fatigue failure see all right 
some technical glitches. Uh, uh, so uh, this is the first lecture, you know. So these things are bound to happen, but uh, hopefully things will be sorted out before I end this uh, lecture. Continuous repetitive loads, as I mentioned, you know, they cause a, a big failure, and these loads are thermal, mechanical stresses, vibrations, and so on and so forth. Typically, single I multi-hop aircraft has a, has a life of about 26 years, and a long distance bigger aircraft has a life of about 29, 30 years. And how do we achieve this? Routine visual, periodic rigorous inspection for fault detection, correction, certification, and it has uh, kept us uh, on a good uh, track record. It is uh, resulting in a, not too many catastrophic failures over a century in spite of a phenomenal passenger growth and a cargo movement over the years. This is uh, typically uh, how the Boeing aircraft looks, you know. The one uh, on the, uh, the, the aircraft picture is that of a 787 body. And you have got a fiberglass, uh, the carbon laminate composites, carbon sandwich carbon composites. Sandwich. Okay. Uh, I don't want to hear so many times myself. Okay. Aluminum, steel, titanium type of alloys. And the one on the uh, right side, which is a pie chart, it has uh, all the components you know that are used in Boeing 777. So the important thing over here is that uh, the role of composites have increased enormously in the modern uh, civilian aircraft, and uh, it is bound to happen, you know, because we uh, want to save weight as much as it is possible. So different components in the uh, aircraft, you know, they have different loading conditions and. These different loading conditions make it imperative that various types of materials are used. High performance aircraft alloys like uh, aluminum based alloys, magnesium based alloys, uh, titanium based alloys, nimonate, uh, molybdenum, and so on and so forth. So, making air travel more secure, efficient, sustainable, and economical is the final goal. Now, I'm going to define the uh, Sustainability for the airlines and aircraft in a slightly different fashion in a, a slide or a two. Airframe, uh, the material, there is a static uh, loads and there are dynamic loads. You know, dynamic loads are time varying loads. And uh, aircraft, when it is in a flying, uh, it has got a, it experiences turbulence. It has got a varying speeds, varying weights, and so on and so forth. So these are dynamic loads. Overall size, aerodynamic shape, internal cabin spaces, cockpit ergonomics. You, know. you should uh, have a look at the aircraft uh, cockpit where the captain and the first officer, they sit. It's a very, very tiny space and everything has to be essentially accessible to the pilot and the first officer. And they should know where is what. You know, you cannot just keep on searching, you know, because the operations are in very, very tight time frame. Aircraft designer's goal is to minimize the weight and have appropriate mechanical and thermal properties. This is something which is very important for us, as it is in most of the other uh, 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 transport systems. As far as the engine is concerned, there are two parts. You know, one is the cold section, and another is the hot section. Cold section is the place where uh, the temperatures are restricted. And you will be able to use uh, different type of materials, you know, typically titanium-based alloys. And uh, the yield strength is about 640 MPa. High temperature is about, that is the highest temperature is about 450 degrees Celsius. Whereas if you would go to the combustor, the temperature rises fairly close to about 1200 to 1500 degrees Kelvin. And you need uh, something, you know, which is much more robust, you know, and there. Uh, Nickel-based or the molybden-based uh, alloys are used. Zirconium is also used in big way. So this is uh, about the aircraft in a gist. You know, this is not a comprehensive thing, but this is in a gist. You know. The United Nations, you know, they, they they have identified 17 goals, you know, for the sustainable development, and that is the common theme with which I am working. I mean, your uh, title of your webinar is also sustainability. 
I am talking in terms of aircraft and the space uh, sustainability, and you will be talking about the photovoltaic cells, you know, and then the material that would be required for cleaning the atmosphere and so on and so forth. So these sustainable uh, 17 goals, you know, they have got uh, one common theme that they deal with the people, plants, and planet. Okay, they are not. Uh, I mean, the, the technology is involved in all. Let us put it that way, you know, because. Uh, if you uh, uh, want to have economic growth, you know, then the construction activity has to take place, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all of us uh, are aware of all, all this thing. Climate action has been also decided, you know, that uh, you do not want to, the global warming has to be contained. You know, the COP26 uh, that uh, occurred, you know, just about a couple of weeks ago, they have spelled out, you know, and then the responsibilities of uh, the uh, developed nations, developing nations, undeveloped nations, you know, have been spelled out, there have been a continuous dialogue going on, and hopefully, uh, equitable solutions should come out of it. What is at stake for the aircraft? You know? So now I am defining sustainability, not necessarily from uh, the uh, point of view of material, energy, uh, and uh, so on and so forth, but the sustainability, I am defining it as a function of natural resources. The material has to be extracted and so on and so forth. Energy for extraction and manufacturing, water requirements. Those of you who have seen mines, you know, they need a humongous amount of water. Financial viability. You know, everywhere you cannot find all the materials, you know, so the financial viability, pollution and environmental impact. So I am I'm defining uh, sustainability as a function of all these parameters, you know, and add on a few more if you have. What are the constraints? The main constraints, you know, because as the engineers, you know, we always do what uh, optimization, right? Constraint optimization is something which we have been doing it. The multivariable constraint optimization. So, what are the constraints? One is the resource availability. As I mentioned it to you, all the materials are not going to be available all the places. Extraction and manufacturing costs, operational efficiency, competition, and government policies you know, from point to point. These government policies will. Uh, be amplified a little bit later. And what are the tools? Monitor, inspect, detect, and then go further, reduce, repair, replace, and reuse. Because you want to have the extended life of uh, air, aircraft is a very expensive uh, uh, proposition. Air, aircraft uh, is not a cheap uh, commodity. Uh, the small uh, aircraft, single aisle aircraft, you know, they cost anywhere between 100 to 110. Uh, Billion dollars each. What are the tools? As I mentioned it to you, monitor, detect, reduce, and uh, repair, and so on and so forth. Few more uh, tools. Newer materials have been developed continuously, and those materials are brought in. Improvements in the component efficiencies. This is something which is very important. And aerospace engineers, they continuously strive to improve the efficiency. Even if it is by one percent, that is perfectly all right. But Continuous improvement is really required. Robust design and manufacturing processes. Further to our tools are life cycle estimation and the extension. As I mentioned, it will be 26 years or 29 years. You know, can I go, let us say, 30 years, 32 years to disruption? What are the typical disruptions? Current uh, coronavirus 19 was the biggest disruption you know that we have witnessed in over a century, and this pandemic has. Uh, essentially knocked down the airline industry because uh, there were restrictions on movement. India still doesn't allow the international travel. It is believed that we might do that, you know, in the beginning of New Year. What is the, uh, that was for the aircraft, right? Now, let's talk about the airlines. Because merely constructing uh, a fanciful aircraft, you know, is not going to solve your problem. You know, commercial viability is something which is very important, right? So uh, it is a function of now fleet strength, fuel cost, which keeps on varying. The route map scheduling, you know, because how many times you are going to land and take off. Crew roster, you know, the crew also has to be available to you. Passenger facilities at the airport, you know, because the passenger satisfaction is important. Air conditioning, water, food, etc., etc. Land side um, uh, infrastructure. If you would go to Delhi or Bombay, reaching the airport itself is a humongous task. There is a lot of crowding. So this is called the land side. Then there is the air side. You know, that is the 
number of bays, uh, parking bays, number of uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, gates, you know, where uh, passengers will be able to board quickly and so on and so forth. You know, those things are also very important. What are the typical constraints? The typical constraints are competition, you know. The low-cost carriers, you know, which came into being in uh, the Western world somewhere in the 70s, now they have caught up. In India also, we have got a large number of uh, uh, low-cost carriers and they compete with each other for knocking down the fare in order to get better passenger traffic. Flight slots, they are also uh, continuously fought for. Runway requirements and operations, you know, runways need to be maintained, you know, resurfacing and so on and so forth because it's a wear and tear. Adequate finances for future expansion, government policies, all of you are aware, you know, that Delhi and Bombay airports are a brownfield airports. That means the airport was already existing. We started tinkering with it, you know, and then we started modifying it to suit to the passenger demand. Whereas Hyderabad and Bangalore airports, you know, they are greenfield, but they are absolutely new. They are at a different location. So they were designed in a slightly better fashion. <coughs> um, Adequate finances for the future expansion, government policies. You know, only yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi he uh, opened and inaugurated uh, <coughs> airport you know, in Uttar Pradesh. <coughs> what are the tools? The modern day tools are uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, okay, Internet of Things, blockchain technology, efficiency improve, improvement. Miniaturized sensors, cheap sensors, but very powerful uh, in uh, work ethics. Disruption, again, light restriction due to uh, COVID. So, optimize sustainability, which is a multivariate type of a thing that I just now showed it to you. And that is a big challenge. Optimizing any particular aircraft component is understood. You know, from the weight consideration, from the load consideration, from the material consideration, but if you want to uh, optimize the whole thing, you know, then the problem becomes a little bit more complicated. So sustainability has got uh, 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 social, economic, and environment uh, type of uh, blobs. The intersect of it gives you the equitable, viable, and bearable type of thing. And uh, you uh, further go down. This is easy to comprehend, you know. Everybody would like the idea of sustainability because it would be cost efficient and it will cost the consumers less money and so on and so forth. But uh, population explosion, inequitable distribution of the natural resources, ownership loss, uh, knowledge and the skills to exploit. So uh, materials, technology, etc., you know, they were not uh, forthcoming, you know, let us say in the African continent. But African continent had lots of resources. So whosoever, uh, uh, capitalized on those resources earlier, you know, they made the killing. Uh, panic acceptable solution to such complex situation is indeed a big challenge. Uh, aircraft pollution in numbers, you know, these are, I'm just going to skip through it. Greenhouse gas emission, one fourth of a ton CO2 equivalent per hour of flying. And you uh, would be surprised to know that in uh, uh, North American can continent, you know, there are about 5,000 flights every hour and so on and so forth. You know, 5,000 aircrafts are there permanently in the air. Boeing 737 had 90 kg per hour uh, CO2 emission compared to 92 kg per hour for Boeing 747 in 1969. That substantial type of a thing, you know, but both these uh, uh, aircrafts are uh, in a smaller uh, time uh, frame, you know, so. Emission occurs at a higher altitude, which is more damaging compared to that at the sea level. And this is something, you know, that is uh, very peculiar about the space science. Because uh, we uh, move right across, you know, the stratosphere and go all the way up to the uh, space, which is defined as uh, 80 to 100 uh, kilometers from the surface of the Earth. <coughs> Uh, allowances need to be made for fossil fuel energy in extraction and transportation of the crude oil. So if you if you look at uh, the aircraft in isolation, then efficiency would be defined in terms of the fuel that will be required per kilometer per passenger and so on and so forth. 
But you know, the fuel somewhere has to be extracted. It has to be transported to the airport and so on and so forth. And that also uh, takes an environmental uh, uh, load. You know, in the sense, you know, the ecosystem suffers over there. Inefficiency in the refineries, aircraft manufacturing, maintenance, and staff training. Airport construction, maintenance, heating, air conditioning, all those things, you know, they are important. You cannot look at uh, all these things, you know, in isolation. So what are the uh, mechanisms through which, you know, we are trying to wade our way through? You know? One is the alternate energy source to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by 50% at a 2005 level to be achieved by use of biofuels, that is, uh, Basically, uh, ethanol mixes, you know, recently, you know, fully, uh, uh, the complete flight was with the ethanol. Previously, it was with the biofuel. And uh, we are learning from it, you know, as to what we need to do to ensure, you know, that this particular uh, uh, thing is sustainable and there will be no catastrophic event uh, associated with it. Uh, right now, uh, electric uh, propulsion has become a key theme. Uh, direct hydrogen combustion, that is also a new thing that is coming in, coming around. The second part of it is aircraft maintenance. You know? And uh, with this uh, artificial intelligence machine learning, you know, you will be able to have in-situ type of a, uh, maintenance requirement. So before the aircraft lands, you know, uh, you will be able to... Uh, alert the uh, staff over there, saying this is what is required, you know, please make arrangements. The third thing is slightly crazy to understand, you know, that is a commercial viability of a supersonic, hypersonic commercial transport. <coughs> Why this thing is important? Typically, transatlantic flight from the Europe to uh, the Northern uh, American continent it takes uh, anywhere between something like uh, eight, nine hours. If you start going at a, a supersonic and hypersonic speeds, you will be able to cover it in three hours. <coughs> is it possible? It is doable and uh, it is desirable. We feel if uh, the travel time cuts down, you know, then the environmental load also substantially will go down. Okay. So, Improvement in the propulsion, etc., that is obviously assumed, and then it should be uh, uh, sort of uh, ensured. Can you do away without uh, uh, airlines, you know, or air travel? <coughs> Currently, it is unthinkable, right? Uh, you want to go from one place to another. Uh, people in the 50s, uh, they were mm -hmm. traveling by the boats. You know? Uh, uh, sea by the way of sea, and it used to take uh, two to three weeks, you know, to reach from India to Europe or uh, beyond. So, freedom of mobility is something which is very, very important. Then, uh, leisure people would like to go for uh, vacations and so on and so forth. Improvement in so uh, to help through the poverty reduction, you know, associated with airlines, you know, there were a lot of jobs that are created, and that reduces the poverty. Cultural enrichment and diversity, because right now we are talking about what global village, right? So, uh, cross fertilization of cultures, ideas, uh, living together, all those things are possible. Uh, Transcontinental employment, you know. So, somebody who is uh, from India, you know, he can go and work in um, uh, Gulf countries, you know, uh, help them, or go to Singapore and then help them. Uh, technology transfer. This is also an important uh, aspect of uh, sustainable uh, aviation. Major direct, secondary, indirect economic in, uh, uh, improvement. Then global business links, you know, MNCs, uh, multinationals. Connecting global society is important. Military security, obviously. And positive globalization effects uh, uh, for the uh, global development and uh, trade. You know. So these are some of the things. Um, I do not know how many of you have seen this particular uh, uh, phenomena. I'm calling it a phenomena because it's so, it was one of a kind. And this is called as the Solar Impulse 2. Um, on the right side in the picture, you see this particular Solar Impulse uh, uh, aircraft. 
it is a single passenger type of aircraft you know that means only pilot is there it was a concept concept in uh, achieving the zero carbon dioxide and uh, any type of a pollutant to go all over the world so it started from uh, abu dhabi and it ended in abu dhabi uh, the, the project was uh, started in march 2015 in india at couple of uh, places they landed you know uh, ahmedabad was one such thing you know and varanasi i think you know. and then they went around you know. there were uh, for uh, compared to the boeing 747 this has got a slightly bigger wing span you know. they had about 17000 photovoltaic cells on that and with that you know this particular project was completed what is the fallout of that it is in the uh, le- uh, the left side box you know. to address environmental challenges without compromising economic growth you know. see now you see the idea of sustainability is uh, in terms of the economic growth also you know uh, that that is a mindset change because you cannot just say you know that uh, environment and hence i mean obviously you know if you don't do nothing the environment will not be degraded right if you don't do any uh, uh, sort of a positive step you know but that is downright dangerous you know? so by offering political and economic decision makers a guide to solution so this uh, bertrand uh, picard you know uh, he has proposed you know saying you know that we can do it and that he will be pushing the different governments you know that this is a possibility aircraft also use some uh, smart materials you know passive smart materials respond to the external change without external uh, control then uh, active smart controls utilize feedback loop to enable them to function like a cognitive response all along you know the aerospace engineers they were trying to emulate uh, the birds and the birds are one of the most efficient ones you know because they are natural you know so by which of a feather you know they are able to achieve whatever uh, their aircrafts are trying to do we're trying to learn quite a bit you know from the birds very smart materials intelligent materials and fully integrated uh, smart materials which include the sensors signal processors actuators and having its own power supply so these are the smart materials that uh, are under process for us smart materials you know they will control the aerodynamic surfaces this is called the adaptive wing birds do the adaptive flying right you know uh, when they want to make a left or a right you know they would be just essentially changing uh, the uh, small changes and that small change helps them you know to uh, make a turn and so on so forth damping and tuning of a structures that is rotor crab uh, blade uh, damping uh, this is essentially the helicopter then noise control both radiated engines uh, engine noise and internal cockpit and cabin noise you, know, you want to minimize it self diagnostic capability robotics embedded av- avionics and deicing of aerodynamic surfaces these are some of the things you know that are uh, uh you that, that have been continuously uh, improved upon and explored for i come now a little bit about the spacecraft you know spacecraft material they are expected to traverse enormous distances you know those of you who keep track you know voyager 1 and 2 these uh, things are in operation for more than 50 years you know, and then they have gone beyond every everybody's any stage of imagination the mission on mars you know perseverance you know and then ingenuity these are uh, the marvels technology marvels so space craft which are going to be for a real real long distance you know they are one particular thing you know. the other aspect of it is that a single use that means your pslb gslb type of uh, satellite launch vehicles you know so they would uh, send things uh, across you would have benef- you, you have enormous benefits out of it you know there were uh, basically uh, you know uh, land resource mapping communication satellites tv channels uh, weather forecasting and that particular phase of uh, spacecraft uh, or a space travel is over right now we are trying to explore much beyond our uh, immediate uh, neighborhood and these are gps and so on so forth all of us are using those things you know uh, on a day to day basis uh, 
we need in spacecraft also quite a few uh, precious metals precious metals are not necessarily restricted to only spacecraft but metal is a precious if it is rare and high economic or engineering value which are market driven this is something which is important for you to remember intrinsic physical properties toughness luster resistance to corrosion so you have got a gold platinum copper and so on and so forth these are susceptible to socio geo political uh, reality uh, currently china dominates the newer global battery supply and this is becoming uh, a sort of a thorn in the flesh for the rest of the rest of the world because they are able to throttle or they are able to control you know uh, the complete dominance of uh, electric car vehicles you know and uh, the market their option uh, so biden usa president uh, his election and pfizer reporting 90% gold fluctuated all of you who uh, see the sensex and uh, uh, our uh, stock market going up and down about the precious metal you would know you know what i am talking about uh, this is uh, pretty recent you know just about uh, a week ago this news appeared in new york times global rivalries are miring the clean energy revolution because clean energy is now the global type of requirement right so congo you know which is otherwise uh, uh, doesn't have anything they have got the world's two third cobalt cobalt deposits originally americans were there and then they wanted to make uh, provisions for uh, uh, that particular poor nation you know and providing them uh, financial support and so on so forth subsequently what happened you know is that the china moved in and then they own large quantum of the mines over there and they promised so almost anything and everything so the political thing that i was mentioning it to you now we have shifted from uh, the oil so middle eastern countries you know which were oil rich now they have also they realized you know that oil they are going to run short of it so they have entered into some different uh, business uh, uh, type of a propositions and some of them are hospitality airline and so on so qatar and all that you know emirates qatar those are the biggest uh, uh, airlines currently you know in the world market you know. so these are times are changing and uh, appropriately things are changing uh, suitably cobalt is used you know for tesla elon musk tesla you know long range vehicle and they need about 10 pounds of cobalt in per per, per automobile which is uh, more than 400 times the amount that you need it in the cell phone so now you got to take a pick you know uh, one over the other and you have to decide which one is going to be more uh, beneficial uh, for the world at large so this is what it is you know clean energy metals are produced production of key resources copper nickel cobalt rare earth lithium these are highly concentrated in china congo australia peru indonesia philips uh, philippines and uh, myanmar and russia and uh, where they are processed china is processing most of these materials so they have got a monopoly over these precious materials which are required for the sustainability of our uh, uh, future so nasa you know they sent uh, uh we we started you know space uh, engineers you know they started looking beyond uh going to a different planet is one aspect of it whether it is a habitable planet or not that is another part of it but at least you know the origin of it and then what is happening you know the, those things you know the, you, you need to understand it so nasa had a expedition to asteroid the, the name of that asteroid is bennu and the uh, right side picture shows you about 800 million dollars you know was the uh, project cost and uh, it is called as the osiris rex and uh, each word uh, each alphabet means something origin spectral interpretation resource identification security regolith explorer that is the meaning of that so it started on the 8th of september 2016 and it landed uh, uh, last year that is 2020 and they collected in situ uh, samples you know from that particular uh, asteroid 
what is it you know the venu is uh, closest to the earth number one however it was reaching that particular thing was very very taxing you know because uh, you had to go around the sun and so on so forth then venus diameter just about 500 meters you know pretty small but right you know spacecraft can land on this particular surface mass is 78 billion kg and uh, average orbital speed etc etc those are uh, basically details part of it but uh, mission was primitive asteroid that did not change much in the 4 billion years from the uh, formation of this universe you know, we are 4 and 1/2 billion years old a building block similar to the solar system venu is a carbon rich and may contain organic material so landed on october 2020 and it started its journey back uh, last may on 10th of may 2021 and it would need uh, another two uh, more than two years you know for it to reach and it will bring in situ so this is for the first time after uh, man collected some rocks you know from the moon that uh, we on the earth you know we have been able to collect some material from and what type of material i'm talking about 60 gram uh, nothing right you know but that would give uh, some idea about uh, our universe and so on so forth this is 15 passenger van size type of uh, orbiter like takes a lot of time uh, space dynamics and so on so forth there are few potential uh, targets for the reaches and these are some of them these are asteroids very close to the earth and uh, we are watching asteroids for two reasons you know one is that if it is going to impact earth what would happen to us you know in the first impact you know dinosaurs were lost in the second impact you know uh, what sort of a disaster we would have so we are monitoring them uh, and hoping you know that nothing untoward happens you know. so the estimated value and the delta v is the velocity increment that is required you know that uh, don't bother then composition is uh, uh, written in the last column and you look at the last one you know uh, anteros <coughs> the estimated value in us uh, dollars you know is something like 5570 and these are all metals you know that you are interested in these are high price materials and uh, we are interested in grasping them grabbing them this last but one slide you know uh, one of my colleague you know uh, uh, professor gd sharma in uh, lnmit jaipur he works in the photovoltaic field so he was mentioning you know the organic and inorganic hybrid and purely organic solar cell they have their efficiency is continuously improving and solar cells are going to be uh, the key feature for the future uh, of uh, energy uh, security the uh, i'm going to uh, skip everything that he has said you know but while making these solar cells and all that you know you are using uh, quite a bit of uh, a toxic material you know, and uh, including some form of lead so the sustainability aspect you know you need to figure it out you know in terms of the totality right uh, and that is what i mentioned to you in the first you know, that is a holistic type of a uh, sustainability uh multivariate type of a sustainability is something which is important electric vehicle just take a example you know uh everybody is interested in electric vehicle right now everybody is tom 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 toming you know saying you know that europe would have all electric vehicle by the end of this particular decade or maybe at best you know by 2050 india is going to follow the suit we are lo- looking at the output end once the the uh, electric vehicle is on the uh, road what happens is something you know that is the output end but to make that particular electric vehicle from battery to battery manufacturing the body etc etc you have to take a comprehensive view that is the holistic thing that i was talking to you about so you have to do the inventory of each and every item that is contributing to the environment positively or negatively and then some total of it you will try to figure it out uh, there was another article which i am not mentioning it over here you know thomas friedman wrote you know just about a week ago and he is mentioning you know fusion uh, uh, atomic energy you know that is going to be the single most uh, saving uh, factor you know, as far as the electricity generation is concerned let us wait and see uh, that uh, for the best of humanity you know how and where we will go
I didn't talk about uh, the theme of this particular webinar, which is going to be more towards uh, uh, the environmental protection, water, uh, air, and uh, energy. You know, I didn't talk too much about it. I uh, uh, spelled out the sustainability from my field of specialization, which is the aerospace engineering, which is also cutting edge technology, because we are not uh, looking at uh, uh, solving tomorrow's problem but we are trying to solve the problems after generations after generations in conclusion that i wanted to say you know comprehensive and holistic view of costs and benefits is required even though it may not be obvious for the present so long-term impact long-term effects etc are required definition of sustainability should be made broader the way in which you know, i was telling it to you for the aircraft and the airline I, I redefined, you know, saying, you know, okay, I do not want to look at only one particular part of it. And sustainability may also mean fail proof economic operation, lifelong savings through the reduce, reuse, repair operations, etc. Et Carry on with this. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me opportunity to share a uh, few of the thoughts, though may not be totally synchronous with uh, the theme of the webinar. But I thought that uh, it is equally important. Thank you for your patient uh, uh, listening. I have probably overstepped the time that has been allotted to me. But uh, then again, I have managed to complete what I have to say. Thank you. Somebody can come and detach this. So, uh, thank you, uh, our honorable chairman, uh, for uh, giving his views and uh, very excellent technical uh, presentations uh, at the introductory sections of our uh, this international webinar. Sir, your views and your experience is very much required uh, for the future improvement of the technology. So we definitely uh, take it off in the future. And thank you uh, for giving you time and sharing your experience uh, in this platform, sir. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce the uh, Dr. Shuel, uh, his assistant professor of Nanomaterials Research Institute, Kanajawa University, Japan. Uh, his research interest is materials for energy, organic solar cell, efficient uh, proviscate solar cells, and energy earth resource engineering dye synthesized solar cells etc and uh, his works experience uh, so he has done his uh, phd from uh, in material chemistry kanajawa university and uh, he has the master of science uh, from school of material science japan advanced institute of science and technology so he has worked recent, uh, from 2018 to present as an assistant professor. Before that, he was a postdoctoral research fellow on design and fabrications of proviscate solar cell, Department of Chemistry, School of Science, Tokyo, uh, uh, Tokai University, Japan. And before of that, he was from 2016 to 2017, he was postdoctoral fellow on design and, and designing and fabrications of proviscate solar cell. Institute of Frontier Science Initiative, Kanajao University, Japan. So uh, he has several awards. Uh, some of them are the conference grant for WCPEC 7 in Hawaii, USA. And in 2016, he has the international conference grant for EMRS Spring Meeting and in France and November 2015, he has the international conference grant for MRS Hall meeting and exhibit Boston, USA. And he has more than 63 journal publications and 31 uh, conference paper publications. So with this uh, brief introduction, I will request and invite to Dr. Shoel for his technical lecture. Sir, please. OK, thank you. Can you, can you see my uh, like uh, PPT? Is it OK? Yeah, your PPT is visible, so you can okay, start. OK, thank you. Off. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Oniruddha, for your kind introduction. I am Mohammad Shahidud Jamal uh, from Kanaja University. And uh, here is my uh, 
title is efficient and stable proboscite solar cells enabled by adding ionic liquids and CSI intercalation technology. So here is a, like you can see the Kanajo University, like uh, this is situated in, uh, in Kanajawa city, the capital of Ishikawa prefecture. And we have the two uh, uh, main campuses. Once one is uh, in Kakuma, another one is uh, Takaramachi. I am belongs to in Kakuma campus. Okay. Actually, I am origin from Bangladesh, uh, the capital city of Dhaka. Uh, our country, we got the independent uh, 1971, and uh, my main language, like uh, mother language, is Bangla. And like we are, <laughs> so uh, um, uh, in my academic profile, I did my undergraduate study in Bangladesh. Then I moved to uh, Japan for my under master's study. And, and then I did my uh, doctor of uh, PhD uh, in material chemistry with, with the prestigious like uh, scholarship in Moon Book of Aksha. And I, I I have completed my PhD in November, uh, September 2016, and then I had the one postdoc. Uh, uh, I had twice postdoc before uh, before joining in Nanomaterials Research Institute in 2018. And here you can see the solar research uh, members in Kanajo University. Like here, Professor Taima, he is the group leader for Energy Creation Device Development Group, and. Uh, we have another professor from uh, Queen's University, Professor uh, Jen Michael Nunji. He joined in our research group uh, in 2018 as a research professor. And you can see, like the in uh, Kanajo University, uh, Kanajo University Solar Energy Research Group, they can uh, they have the uh, they fabricate the solar module with the uh, collaboration with uh, like company, Ideal Easter company and Kuramoto company. And their seed technology uh, now like uh, installed in, you know, the 2011 have the big tsunami in Tohoku in Japan. And then the, our seed technology now like installed in, uh, in that area to provide the electricity. You can see here my current research area is like the highly stable proboscite solar cell and I'm also working with the organic photovoltaics and I'm also working with the dye synthesis type of solar cells. So here uh, today I'll brief talk about in the uh, in the first topic, in the first part of my presentation, I'll brief talk about the benefit of ionic liquids for the fabrication of efficient proboscite solar cells. In the second part of my talk, I will talk about the CSI intercalation technology into proboscite framework. And in the third part of my technology, uh, third part of my talk, I will briefly talk about the elect brokite uh, uh, as the electron transport layer for efficient and stable proboscite solar cells. And then I will I will go for the future prospects and then acknowledgement. As you all know, the renewable energy sources are like the from the uh, uh, foundation of global decarbonization strategy to reduce the carbon emission by 80 percent by 2015. Uh, you can see here from this figure the like the renewable energy sources like the geothermal energy, wind thermal, wind energy, solar, and hydro. And among these, like photovoltaic solar technology are the most attractive technology for the shift. Uh, to a low carbon economy to the society. So uh, as you all know, like the silicon can be considered as a first generation solar cells and then the cadmium telluride like the CIGS can be like the thin film technology can be considered as a second generation solar cells and this generation solar cell can be considered like the proboscite type of solar cell, dye synthesis solar cell, uh, organic photovoltaics and quantum dot type of solar cells. As you all know, the uh, like the one dimensional uh, one D first generation and second generation solar cells, uh, like the first generation solar cell, like the silicon or gallium arsenide based uh, inorganic wafer, and then the thin film is related like the CIGS and cadmium telluride that is uh, related to the uh, second generation solar cells. We can see like the these two type of solar cell have the uh, like environmental big effect. 
So as you can see here, the first generation solar cells, uh, like the good thing is, like it's very highly stable. It can go the 20 years or 30 years. Uh, it's uh, like the uh, have the stability. But problem is, this material is materials and production cost is quite high, and it co uh, requires a large amount of energy, like the to uh, to fabricate the thin film, and also the like the after having the thin film, it's excessive water is used and also it leads the large uh, like land is needed in case of the thin film also the it's less abundant element like the tellurium indium and so on and it's also required a large amount of uh, large amount of energy because like the we uh, the, uh, we use the vacuum deposition like the to to run the vacuum deposition we need lo uh, really the big amount of energy uh, energy and also the like the because we use the like vacuum deposition that's why production production cost is quite high and also the complicated structure but but if we go to go think about the next generation solar cells like the proboscite type of solar cell it's really the it's easy and low cost and colorful and it's also make uh, the portable and also the low temperature process can be possible and materials are uh, like abundance is available and also this type of materials are eco-friendly so so the now the next like the degeneration law mostly focuses the like the to further improve or develop uh, the next generation uh, solar cells if we talk about uh, like the proboscite can be stand with the silicon solar cells or like first generation or second generation solar cells. We can see from this figure, actually the silicon is highly stable and with the high performance, uh, there is no doubt. It can go the 20 years, 30 years. Uh, uh, it's really good. But if we think about the cost, definitely we must need to find out the alternative of uh, silicon. Like that can be uh, uh, that can be an as example of proboscite type of solar cells that is very low cost and also the if you, uh, uh, in terms of the efficiency is quite mostly similar because the silicon uh, power performance around 26 percent and proboscite power conversion efficiency also around 26 uh, percent it means around 25.5 percent but uh, silicon is highly stable but proboscite is not stable that's why lots of lots of like the uh, development is highly required in terms of uh, proboscite type of solar cells as you can see here the from the green, if we think about the green innovation like the if we consider the material it must be earth abundant and it should be fabrication process should be like low cost like inexpensive if we consider the inexpensive process, like the low temperature, it should be low temperature, it should be slow or solution process and roll to roll manufacturing. And it should maintain the high efficiency and also the uh, easy installation like the lightweight and flexibility. If we think about the manufacturing process, like the it should be, uh, we must need to be considered like the solution process. Uh, it can be possible for the disynthesized solar cell, quantum dot solar cells, CZTS and organic and proboscite type, type of solar cells. And we need to balance the for future like the three E like economy, environment, energy and safety. Then we can fulfill uh, the, the green innovation. So as you can see here from a pro, uh, like pro, uh, researcher Gaste Pros, he found it like the this like the calcium titanium uh, uh, like proboscite in Ural mountain and uh, Professor Leproboski provided like the fund and finally these materials was named by Professor Leproboski. You can see that this type of like this calcium titanium oxide the chemical formula we can we can call the ABX3. ABX means like a cation like at a cation can be like organic or inorganic cations and b cation can be divalent cation like the it can be lead it can be stainers it can be bismuth it can be gal galenium uh, and also the halogen it means monovalent halide anion like iodine chlorine bromine but interesting thing for the proboscite is we can easily tune the band gap by changing the halogen aside aside cation and halogen halogen by changing the halogen you can see here the this one is solar spectrum actually the proboscite is like the goes up to 800 
the, like the uh, the wavelength visible region it's mostly the visible region if we can uh, like the combine with uh, like the tandem like the uh, uh, like the like perovskite with silicon really that we can we can uh, uh, like uh, increase the oil light absorption wavelength and another interesting thing is like if you think about the single a uh, single proboscide like the single junction proboscide we can easily tune up to uh, recently like the someone considered with the lead with sn like lead 50% and sn 50% then they can uh, increase the wavelength up to 100 1060 nanometer so another thing is you can see the proboscide materials actually it's like the tunable band gap can be possible 1.1 electrobolt to 3.1 electrobolt and it's also the another important thing is high absorption coefficient and also the high carrier mobility and large division length and low temperature solution process possible you can see how we can make the device here is organic material we can consider the methyl ammonium as organic and lead as a lead iodide as a inorganic then we can make the solution and then we can go for a spin coat and another possibility we can make like uh, make the film through the vacuum evaporation system so considering these two spin coat and vacuum deposition system we can fabricate uh, perovskite uh, device here is the you can see the mechanism actually uh, 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 the light usually this one is like the ito glass we can consider ito or fto indium tin oxide or fluorine tin oxide both can be considered and then the light just passes through the proboscide and make the exciton uh, positive and negative then the positive goes through the positive electron and neg uh, el uh, negative uh, electron goes to the elec this electrode and finally uh, there by generating the electric current and uh, etl means like electron transport layer this one is whole transport layer etl etl means like the uh, uh, this layer can extract the more electron from the proboscide and transfer to the ito and here you can see the conventional structure that is like the we have the ito or fto substrate then electron transport layer then we will use the proboscide then we will consider the htl means whole transport layer that means uh, extract the hole and block the electron and th then we can uh, consider the metal contact like the gold silver aluminum uh, anything can be possible and the is inverted structure is like the it's just opposite we just uh, like uh, the changes Uh, uh you can see the whole transport layer uh, proboscide and etl and then we can use the any type of metal contact that is the uh, in general thing for the proboscide type of solar cells so let's move uh, the this this type of probos this proboscide type of material uh, for the first time in 2009 uh, used uh, professor um, uh, Miyasaka, he is like he is a professor from um, Toei Ni Yokohama University in Japan. Now he is the uh, uh, the professor also in Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, Tokyo University of Tokyo, and he used for the first time like like as you all knows the like the dye synthesis type of solar cell. Actually, he considered the proboscide as a dye and uh, on. FTO and then for the first time he uh, he uh, got the power conversion efficiency around 3.81 and then like then the uh, researcher found the while they use the liquid electrolyte that liquid electrolyte immediately uh, attached with the proboscide and uh, resulted in degrad so then a researcher was thinking that okay we will uh, they will uh, replace the this liquid electrolyte to whole solid state whole transport layer that was developed by professor park in korea he uh, he developed for the first time with the solid state whole transport layer uh, 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 instead of the electrolyte uh, liquid electrolyte and then you can see these are the pioneer works the uh, professor miyasaka he developed uh, he used proboscite material uh, in proboscide sensitized solar cells in 2009 and then developed 
like solid state was developed by Professor Park and further developed like the uh, Professor uh, Michael Gradual and Snaith and again further developed uh, with Professor Miyasaka. These are the train for pioneer work for the proboscite type of solar cells. And let's move the, for the development of proboscite solar cells. You can see, as I mentioned earlier, the like proboscite, it was started 2009 by Professor Miyasaka that the power conversion efficiency was 3.8. Now, like it's like the, within last 10 years, it's rapidly improved the power conversion efficiency of proboscite type of solar cells up to 25.5%. If we uh, consider the silicon type of solar cells uh, to further improve uh, in this stage, it takes literally the very long time. It's like around uh, 40 or 50 years. But uh, in case of the proboscite, actually it's rapidly uh, improved the power conversion efficiency. So in the first part, I will brief talk about the benefit of ionic liquid for the fabrication of efficient and stable proboscite photovoltaics. So as I mentioned earlier, the proboscite, uh, the, the current challenges actually the uh, related to the long-term operational stability. The current uh, proboscite type solar cells have, have the lack of uh, stability and also the limited in, uh, advancement in power conversion efficiency. And another thing is lack control of proboscite morphology. Sorry, you can see these are the, uh, like, if we want to further improve the power conversion efficiency, we must need to be considered the uniform morphology of proboscite, and it should maintain the crystallinity, and it should have the large grain. Because as you all know, the proboscite uh, morphology and crystallinity are correlated with the photovoltaic properties. It means if we can, uh, can improve like the high quality proboscite morphology and maintain the high crystallinity with large grain, definitely the power conversion efficiency will be improved as well as stability will improve. So to tune the proboscite morphology, uh, 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 researcher uh, recently uses the ionic liquid. So uh, the advantage of ionic liquid is while they added the ionic liquid, it can control the crystal and modify the interface and improve the stability and uh, uh, and finally uh, 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 easily uh, like as you all know the ionic liquid is more hydrophobic easily uh, uh, penetrate easily uh, like the um, improve the moisture stability as well as light soaking stability as well as the stability is improved this one recently actually the we had uh, like the professor nunji and uh, me uh, we uh, we succeed to have the this uh, uh, review, and you can see in like while I was the PhD student, actually the I graduate I I already mentioned earlier the I graduate 2016 in uh, September. Actually, the in 2015, while I was the PhD second grade students, for the first time, we incorporate this ionic liquid in proboscite uh, precursor solution. And then we just go for the spin coat, and then we obtained a spherical proboscite nanoparticle. And this spherical nanoparticle was further confirmed by the atomic force microscopic image. And then the, during my PhD, I had the patent. These are the Japanese patent number. The, the, I am very much happy for this because the, we introduced the, some new technology to the scientific community. Uh, though we couldn't have the like improve the power conversion efficiency, but uh, uh, the uh, in uh, we we like uh, introduced the 2015, but 2019 Professor Senei he got the nature. Unfortunately, it's completely unfortunate for me, but though I couldn't improve the power conversion efficiency. Anyway, and. Uh, like you can see the from this figure, like we change the concentration, varying concentration of ionic liquid in proboscite precursor solution. We consider the one white person of ionic liquid, three white person of ionic liquid, seven white person and ten white person ionic liquid in uh, proboscite precursor solution. We obtain one and three. We we obtain the very spherical uh, shape of uh, proboscite nanoparticle. We obtain, but in case of the seven and ten, we couldn't uh, obtain. It's completely aggregated. Later I will explained it with equation. 
and this one was further confirmed by the atomic force microscopic image you can see one and three can uh, we obtained the very spherical nanoparticle but in case of the seven and ten uh, we couldn't uh, like the particle is mostly aggregated the reason is uh, 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 we can see the viscosity of ionic liquid DMF mixer because the, we use the DMF as a main solvent and ionic liquid we considered as an additive uh, in perovskite precursor solution. So it means the viscosity of ionic liquid DMF mix, mixer is exponentially increased when the molar fraction of DMF is decreased. In that case, the when the amount of ionic liquid is increased, so in that case, the viscosity of the system is increases. So diffusion of the resulting complex hindered. That's the reason uh, uh, actually the higher amount of ionic liquid in perovskite precursor solution cannot form uh, the nanoparticle. Okay, then uh, we, uh, we propose the mechanism uh, for uh, the perovskite nanoparticle, formation mechanism of perovskite nanoparticle. One is you can see the only DMF only system Another one is DMF with ionic liquid system. As you all know, the while we spin coat with the perovskite solution and immediately this uh, DMF solvent is evaporate while we applied the temperature. So then the this the perovskite grain is disordered and could look like the ribbon like shape. But while uh, we added the very small amount of ionic liquid in uh, DMF uh, 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 solution, you can see these ionic liquid can retard the evaporation and it makes the slow nucleation. Then uh, we, ob we observe the very small cluster uh, yeah, that was further confirmed from these AFM images. You can see the very small cluster was formed. And then, then, uh, then we applied the temperature. Then it's like the uh, you can see the very transparent perovskite film with the very spherical nanoparticle. It means the existing of ionic liquid. Maybe the this ionic liquid is coated with uh, with with the perovskite nanoparticle. And then we go for the photovoltaic performance. Actually, the the performance was very small, uh, very low because only three percent. You can see the region. Well, then we did the cross-section image, and you can see this one is spherical, the spherical nanoparticle, the nanoparticle is spherical type, right? So then while we like the uh, spin coat of spiro, then these like the penetrate to the ITO or uh, to the FTO or TIO2. That's result actually uh, to have the low performance of uh, power conversion efficiency while we consider the perovskite nanoparticle as a absorber layer. And then recently we newly designed and applied this nanoparticle seeded growth, this nanoparticle we considered as a seeded growth concept for efficient and perovskite type of solar cell with high stability. What we did in this study you can see here, uh, previously uh, we can see here the ionic liquid mix uh, solution with just spin coat and then the, we got the very small uh, perovskite small clusters and that is wet film and then on wet film we again deposited the triple cation based perovskite precursor solution and then uh, well, like the this type of ionic liquid actually can retard the nucleation, and then you can see the few, fewer clusters are left uh, while spin coat and act as heterogeneous nucleation sites. This facilitates facilitates nucleation of final perovskite uh, because of the nucleation energy variable for crystal growth with seed crystal is lower than the without seed. Then the uh, we schematic the perovskite nanoparticle embedded in perovskite grain. And finally, we succeed to make the dense perovskite film. You can see from here the uh, scanning electron microscopic image. You can see this one is like the perovskite nanoparticle. You can see the spherical nanoparticle. This one is triple cation like the cesium, formidium, and methyl ammonium based uh, perovskite. Uh, this one is pristine 
triple cation base perovskite the while we mix these two and you can see the our grains we we we, we, we from you can see the from the uh, the histogram we can see the more than one micron uh, sizes grains grain we obtained and these are the device structure you can see the here is the cross section image this one is pristine triple cation proboscite and this one is nanoparticle uh, embedded triple cation we can see the dense proboscite uh, film uh, can be observed in the cross section images then uh, we 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 published this paper in uh, acs applied materials and interface as we can see the from the like ib curve and uh, like ipc ib curve while we embedded nanoparticle with the triple cation then in all cases the jsc voc and field factor in all cases is improved improved in case of the ipc uh, also the absorption is around 90% we obtain and uh, uh, to be honest, I get the great support. Uh, I should acknowledge Professor uh, Nunji. Uh, actually, he supported me a lot uh, uh, for, uh, for. And then uh, you can see that our champion devices, uh, we reach around the 20% while you embedded uh, nanoparticle with the triple cation as compared with the pristine uh, samples. And then we have the very, uh, very good the reproducibility result while we embedded nanoparticle with the triple cation based perovskite type of solar cells, as compared with the pristine uh, triple cation based perovskite. Uh, like uh, then we measured the life saving stability. Excuse me, can you hear me? It's like the some voice is a little bit noisy. Yes, yes, yes. But noise, some noise is coming. Now, now it's fine. Now it's fine. You can carry okay, on. Okay, thank. You okay, thank on. you. Then we measured the light soaking stability. What is the light soaking stability? Means once we have fabricated the device, then we just put uh, on the solar simulator, then then continuous light radiation. It means several hours. Then we checked up to two more than two hours. Like the our device retained more than ninety percent. And then the, we measured the moisture stability. Uh, moisture stability uh, with the you can see our device is device is uh, non encapsulated. It means there is no encapsulation. It means we fabricate the device and then we left this device in uh, ambient condition like humidity around 40 to 50 percent uh, in dark condition, and we measure after one week, one week. And then uh, we uh, we measure like up to six thousand hours. It means more than eight months. Our device retain the more than eighty percent, uh, as compared with like uh, the only the pristine uh, uh, triple cation based uh, device. The uh, then uh, we find out the region the why our device is highly stable, and then we measure the water contact angle measurement. From these water contact angle measurement, you can see this one is pristine 54 and this one is like ionic liquid aided nanoparticle with triple cation that goes the 72% uh, the con contact angle. It means the hydrophobicity is improved. It means these ionic liquid aided nanoparticle uh, make the barrier uh, with the water molecule. So that's why uh, um, uh, our like the ionic liquid aided nanoparticle with triple cation based devices highly stable and to further like the uh, 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 the check the okay we will consider this time we will not consider the triple cation we consider the single cation like methyl ammonium normal perovskite like methyl ammonium lead iodide this one is pristine methyl ammonium lead iodide and this one uh, we change triple cation to single cation based perovskite with ionic liquid aided nanoparticle. You can see the large grain sizes uh, changes. And also the power conversion to the JSC is also just changes. And then the we, uh, we you can see the light soaking stability also the change. It means, uh, this means the effectiveness of ionic liquid aided nanoparticle embed in proboscite based uh, uh, solar cell 
have the highly high stable with high performance. Then this research was recently uh, 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 report, uh, like the reported in NHK, NHK television in Japan. And then uh, this report was reported in, in uh, uh, Japanese, like the very like famous uh, newspaper, this work. Mm, okay, uh, let's move in the second part of my talk. Uh, I will introduce the CSI intercalation technology in uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide framework for highly stable proboscite solar cells. As we can see, the people can use the CGM in uh, usually in uh, solution process. Uh, they use the CGM iodide, uh, uh, CGM uh, iodide mixed with the like the single cation, double cation, or triple cation. Um, Best proboscide because actually the you know the like the solution process it is very difficult to control the composition of cesium cesium as an inorganic material so also the also the difficult to control the thickness so that's why the total overall performance and stability is decreased but in this study we attempt to promote the precise intercalation of CSI molecule into host MAPBI3, it means methyl ammonium lead iodide proboscide film uh, through up and bottom layer, which contribute like to fabricate the high quality proboscide film uh, that result in efficient and stable proboscide solar cells. What we did this in this study, you can see from here the uh, uh, normal proboscite we, we, we use as a sp uh, by spin coat, this one. And this one, like you can see, uh, the we, we have the proboscite layer. Then uh, we deposited only very thin layer, 5 nanometer of CSI on uh, a proboscite layer. In the third part, we just make the bottom side the CSI layer, and finally we uh, sandwich proboscite by CSI layer. Only five nanometer and five nanometer. And this one we consider the pristine proboscite. This one up layer intercalated. This one is down layer intercalated, and this one is double layer intercalated. It means the both layer both sides of proboscite. And you can see this one is pristine uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide. The, but while we embedded, while we added uh, like the only five nanometer of CSI uh, in both sides of proboscite, the grain size is quite improved. It means both sides intercalation perfectly intercalate into uh, MAPBI3 framework. And these are the like cross section images. And you can see the very important part is from these EDX mapping, we can understand the like the CSI molecule, uh, molecule distributed across the proboscite film. You can see from the, this one is cross section image from double layer of CSI. It means the bottom CSI and up layer also the CSI. It means proboscite was completely sandwiched by the CSI layer. You can see from here CSI is, you can see this like the white it, circle, it means the CSI molecule completely exchange, completely mix. It means completely intercalated inside the proboscite film. And this research actually, the recently uh, I supervised uh, completely this research and this research was like the uh, published in Nano Energy and also the we got the like the sufficient uh, yeah, like huge support from professor jan michael nonje and you can see the while we uh, embedded the double layer intercalated that goes around 18 around 19 uh, 19% the power conversion efficiency as compared with the pristine proboscite uh, uh, mapbi3 based proboscite solar cells. And here uh, you can see that we have the very, uh, very uh, like the good uh, reproducibility results while we 
uh, added the very thin layer of CSI in both, both sides in uh, perovskite layer uh, that also shows the highly reproducible results. And then you can see that we measure the long term stability. You can see that we measure the light soaking stability. It means that in the, oh, we just put on the solar simulator and then the uh, like the is look like um, more than two hours and our device mostly uh, retain the more than 90 percent stability stable as compared with the pristine methyl ammonium lead iodide based solar cells and then we measure the moisture stability we have the like the as i mentioned these this solar cell is completely uh, non encapsulation i mean that there is no encapsulation uh, it means we have we just we fabricate the device and the like origin sample is just left in ambient condition in dark uh the humidity around like the 40 to 50 percent and after like the 4000 hours it means after four, around six months we we we, uh, we observe the our device retain more than 90 percent and in the third part of my pe uh, presentation i'll uh, um, uh, introduce the brokite type of uh, nanoparticle, it means brokite. I mean, there is one phase where TiO2, where the where people mostly use the photocatalyst uh, 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 um, as, uh, as uh, like application for TiO2 nanoparticle. TiO2 has the four type of phases like anatase phase, brokite phase, rutile, and bronze phase. One of them is brokite. And we introduce this brokite type of uh, TiO2 nanoparticle as the electron transport layer for stable proboscite solar cells. Here you can see here, uh, you can see like there are several strategy for modifying the TIOT ETL layer. Like the, you can see the morphology control doping, surface modification and composition. There are many uh, like the strategies. Actually the ideal strategy to have the electron transport layer that must be simple processing, that should be low cost, Jet, that should be low low temperature. I mean, uh, annealing temperature should be low and it should be suitable band alignment with the perovskite. Then you can consider the ideal electron transport material for perovskite solar cell application. Here you can see this one is like the compact uh, TI to compact layer that modified by TI to nanoparticle and this type of TI to brokered TI to nanoparticle was uh, was synthesized by Professor Koji Tomita uh, in Tokai University in Japan. And this type of brokered TI to nanoparticle is highly crystalline and also the pure phase of brokered and also it's non-toxic and environment friendly approach. They use uh, take the hydrothermal process. And then while I uh, consider this brokerite nanoparticle as a bilayer with the compact TiO2, then overall the electron transport and charge extraction and lower, we obtain the lower interfacial recombination and also enhance the device performance and stability. This one actually, the, this, uh, uh, this research was done in 2019 while I had a postdoc in Tokai University. Um, I considered the, for the first time we design and consider the different ETL, different type of ETL like the we consider, you can see, uh, we consider the phase junction C, the, like the FTOA, it means A means like the, like the anatase TiO2 uh, uh, that was deposited uh, by the spray pyrolysis technique. We make the compact TiO2 film. And this FTOB means like the brokite was deposited on FTO. Brokite, it's as a electron transport layer. And then we considered the, like the, you can see, as I mentioned earlier, the TIA2 have, has a four type of phase, anatase, brokite, rutile, and, uh, uh, and bronze. You can see like the, here we consider the anatase, here we consider the brokite, then, uh, like one semiconductor TIO to have the two phases. We considered, yeah, okay, let's try with anatase and brokite. First, we uh, deposit the anatase phase, then we deposit the brokite phase. And th this one is just alternate. 
and then uh, our uh, power conversion efficiency around 70 percent these are the colloidal suspension of brokite um, and the, the brokite type of nanoparticle uh, was around the around 50 nanometer the length so what we did is here for the first time actually the as we all uh, know the this one the energy level alignment like the if we consider the anatis ti2 and the if we consider the brokite ti2 nanoparticle it means you can see the proboscite at that time we considered the triple curtain it's like the conduction band i mean the lumo level is mostly similar it means source transport from proboscite to f2 is quite easier while we add uh, brokite layer between anatase and perovskite. So it means like the conduction band edge of brokite is slightly above than those of anatase and rutile, which is expected to promote the electron transfer from brokite to anatase. And this provide a potential new route to manipulate the charge transport at the TI to heterobase junction in semiconductor device. And if I do, if we do, uh, we did the opposite. It means we have the brokite, we will first deposit the brokite nanoparticle on FTO, then we will deposit the anatase. There is a big mix mismatch. That's why the our power conversion efficiency was rapidly reduced. You can see the FTO BA. It means brokite was deposited on FTO, and then anatase was deposited on brokite. That called the FTO BA, this one. There is a big mismatch that's result uh, or have the very low performance while I uh, just uh, change the order. And this concept actually the for the first time like the heterophase junction concept uh, uh, we provide in proboscite type of solar cells. And also another interesting is this achievement was selected as a research highlight by the Nature Index Spinger uh, Nature Editorial Team. That was really, uh, I'm very happy, very much happy to have this type of uh, achievement. And uh, recently we had the another collaboration uh, research work was published in Chemical Engineering Journal that was like the, the sim like the, we combine experiment and simulation. Uh, the simulation work was done by Dr. Ismail from uh, University of da California, Davis, and Professor Kinney from Stanford University in USA. They uh, investigate with the three-dimensional finite difference time domain. It means the FTTD uh, uh, with the finite element method, the simulation, and um, for the optical uh, site, and we provided the experimental uh, site. Uh, then uh, this study actually we can see uh, uh, our collaborator synthesized the anatase type of Ti2 nanoparticle and then uh, we kept very low temperature only uh, 180 degrees C. We annealed then we obtained the very dense uh, Ti2 film. You can see from this cross section and then uh, uh, this dense uh, Ti2 like the this one you can see the uh, we have the very high performance around uh, 17 18 percent uh, power conversion efficiency but but then we propose with the dome like shape to further optimal to get like the to scatter the light like the to scatter the light i mean the to further improve the absorption and we, we we consider we propose the dome like shape and finally we uh, we provided uh, proposed the power conversion efficiency we can be possible up to 23% if we go through this super uh, like uh, super state substrate uh, configuration and this one is uh, like the recent progress of lead free proboscite type of solar cells in our laboratory, we tried like the actually the, as you all know the uh, like the lead is a concern uh, for the uh, for the environment. So okay, let's try with the lead free proboscite. Uh, we consider the bismuth CS cesium bismuth iodide like the CS3 Bi2 I9, and we deposit by using the vacuum deposition uh, like the Bi I3 and CSI and. Uh, you can see very interesting result actually. 
like the once we fabricate the film and we left the 150 days we obtain there is no degradation it means like the film there is no no degradation actually the it, that can be confirmed by using the evv you can see the 0 to 115 the, there is no shifted it means our this device is like this film is highly stable in air and then we measured the device and you can see so like the up to 60 days there is no degradation uh, while we considered uh, like the cesium based bismuth iodide and we compare with the cesium lead iodide. Cesium lead iodide is problem is is immediately degrade, uh, degrade after uh, after making the thin film. So finally, uh, actually, I want to like the pro uh, convey some like the future prospects. So up to now, as we can we can know the the history of perovskite. Up to in the initial stage, uh, uh, researchers in, like easily can improve the power conversion efficiency by changing the composition of like the single cation to triple cation. Then they can can get the around the 25 percent. But if we uh, like the uh, gener honestly speaking, if we can uh, reach the Shockley Kaichan limit, uh, like we must need to be considered the because as you all know, the perovskite is sandwich type, it means there are many layers in the device. We must need to be considered each and every layers. Uh, 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 then, uh, then there is the high possibility to further improve. Uh, the power conversion efficiency as well as stability. And another thing is like the uh, in 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 terms of upscaling perovskite uh, solar cells with modules, we must need to be uh, find out alternative of uh, the like the coating method, like spin coating method. That is another uh, another issue, and also uh, the I do believe I personally do believe because I am doing the this perovskite type of solar cell research last eight years. Uh, according to my understanding, the single junction perovskite can definitely can uh, can reach the around thirty percent, but we can further improve the power conversion efficiency if we consider the perovskite with the silicon. It means uh, if we consider the perovskite um, uh, like the as a wide band gap, and silicon is a narrow band gap, and make the tandem that that remarkably improve the power conversion efficiency as well as stability. And uh, here, uh, like uh, um, here is my uh, like the, I will just back to my group of my research activity. Here you can see, like the uh, I started in Nanomaterials Research Institute as assistant professor in 2018, and this year actually, uh, like we published already 25 articles with, uh, with you can see the very high impact journal like the two, three from two from nano energy, one from uh, nano microliter, two from chemical engineering journal, two from. ACS AMI and one from Solar RL. These all of my first author publication this year. And this year we have the another like the another six articles like is under review. I got the like the as I mentioned earlier, I get the really the huge support uh, from Professor uh, Jan Michael Nunji. Then finally, finally I succeed to uh, to have the huge achievement in this year. And now the, my publication is reached about around the 62 or uh, around 63 publications. And also this year, the my research was featured in Akantas in October 2011 in Kanajo University. Uh, there was uh, only three research group was selected, and uh, my research is, was one of them. I am really the very much uh, like happy to see. Uh, my research uh, uh, news in Kanazo University, the features. And also that this group are very, really that they are, this group was very big group in Kanazo University. I'm very happy to see beside of them. And you can see here, uh, uh, 
my first or third articles were awarded for the four, th four times as the paper of the month, which is the honored the best upon the best academic paper in Kanajo University. And, and this one, and then finally, I should acknowledge uh, Professor Jan Michael Nunji from Queen's University and a research professor in Kanajo University uh, for getting the huge support from him. And I should also acknowledge uh, Dr. Ismail, uh, Professor Kinip, Dr. Akhtar Jaman, and uh, Professor uh, Japian from Hong Kong University. These all are the simulation guys. Actually, the, I am I, I, I really I am very much uh, uh, I got the huge support from them as well and uh, recently we combined the experiment and simulation so it's really the very nice study to provide the mechanism internal mechanism based on the optics based on the experiment and also that i have like the like the several collaboration uh, research work with uh, professor miyasaka who is the pioneer for proboscite type of solar cells i have i have the several publication with him and also the I have uh, the, the uh, another several several co uh, collaboration with different different countries, and also that here is you can see the our lab members. Though it's this figure is quite uh, old, anyway. And okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. I am sorry for taking the long time. I'm sorry for that. That's all my presentation. And I'll be happy if anyone have the, any comments or uh, uh, any. I'll be happy to discuss. Okay, so thank you for your uh, enthusiast lecture and very detailed lecture in Poviskite. So uh, it's a very good materials nowadays that people are uh, doing research all over the world. So the session is open for the questions for two, three questions we, we can take very quickly. Yes, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, also, had a very, very, very uh, beautiful uh, talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, two uh, small questions. Um, uh, the yeah, first sure. one is, uh, you, uh, what do you think about inverted uh, architecture of the okay. uh, perovskite yeah. cell? Because all you did uh, is about uh, IP direct. structure. Yes, yeah. NIP structure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, nice questions. Actually, uh, in uh, like the, in my cases, uh, I, uh, uh, we usually do the conventional structure. It means ITO uh, or FTO. Then we use electron transport and perovskite hole transport and uh, metal contact. Actually, the we found actually that we use the uh, uh, spiral. Spire material is organic material is very highly cost costable material. So we want to recently we did we changes the from spire to nickel oxide. That data I didn't show it, but we already started uh, with the PTA. We considered though that material is organic, but we used uh, PTA on ITO substrate, and uh, we 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 already obtained around the 18 or 19 percent power conversion efficiency. And recently, we started also the nickel oxide, uh, nickel oxide uh, on FTO substrate. That also goes around uh, 17 or 18 uh, per percent. In terms of the stability, we changes from uh, spiral to nickel oxide. But while we embedded the PIN structure, there is another issue. So though we can uh, we can have the more highly stable like the nickel oxide than the spiral, but there is an issue is here. There is an issue for the uh, like the contact between the PC. We consider the electron transport layer like the PCBM, you know, the oil, the fluorine, the derivatives, the PCBM. Uh, with the perovskite, there is an interfacial. Actually, the uh, the there is a the uh, the some interfacial uh, problem like the inter well, like well, that's why we couldn't improve the uh, stability stability issue. But I do believe uh, the in terms of the cost, uh, we should not um, go with the NIP structure. But if we want to make the more low cost then the inverted structure should be more suitable. Then we can consider nickel oxide or uh, like the C copper, copper iodide, or we can consider the zinc thalocyanin, or we can consider the copper thalocyanin. These all are the inorganic type of uh, whole transport layer that might be suitable for future stable solar cells. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more, can I one more small question? Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, uh, you talk about uh, um, uh, liquid, uh, liquid, uh, ionic liquid. You yes. told that uh, about three percent of yeah. uh, by weight. Yes, it's um, uh, more optimal, the most optimal. Yes, yes. and um, uh, how uh, is it? Uh, this amount of uh, ion, ion liquid enough to uh, to protect uh, the surface uh, from water. Yeah, you told, uh, you told that it is uh, increase uh, the stability due to pre presence present of uh, okay. presence of the ionic liquid. Okay, okay. In terms of uh, this, yeah, yes. yeah, I yes. will. Okay, okay. I will have the another supporting information. I will go through that. That then it might be more easy to uh, just a moment. So see. Uh, uh, the ionic liquid actually can retard the nucleation, can retard or, or slow the nucleation. That's the result to have the very, very uh, like the uh, like high quality proboscite film. Like the uh, as I mentioned uh, in 2015, we for the we like the reported for the first time in the scientific community uh, ionic liquid in proboscite precursor solution and go for the photovoltaic performance. Uh, though we didn't uh, like the improve the power conversion efficiency, but uh, Professor Senate, as I mentioned earlier, you can see while they incorporate the very uh, very less amount of ionic liquid as an additive in perovskite precursor solution, you can see the the like the 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 stability is huge improved. Like the this one is the up to now the best uh, stable perovskite solar cells up to now. But in case in terms of in our research, like the 3 white percent, we, we mentioned the 3 white percent of ionic liquid while we added in proboscite precursor solution that can give uh, the very spherical and high quality proboscite film. But in our cases, like the we only the while we considered the uh, proboscite nanoparticle as a photo absorber layer, we couldn't improve the uh, performance because the the spherical shape grain is spherical so one one particle to another particle there is a always left some space but uh, but while you consider that these mapv nanoparticle as a seed in triple cation and then we observe from the uh, uh, like a quant uh, a contact angle measurement we understand the uh, like uh, we uh, uh, the the film is become more hydrophobic, so that's why the there is the less possibility actually uh, to penetrate the water molecule in uh, proboscite film. Uh, so that was like the your answer. That was like the I can assure uh, confirm by using if you see this water contact angle, it means hydrophobicity is improved while you added the ionic liquid added nanoparticle in uh, proboscite film. It okay. means. Well, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you Dr. Shoel, uh, for your uh, technical discussions regarding this matter. So we can also contact later on uh, with Dr. Shoel uh, if you have any yeah, questions. Sure. Okay. So yeah, sure, sure. Thank sure, you definitely. for your nice lecture, Dr. Shoel. We definitely be in contact uh, next yeah, time. Yeah, you are most you are most welcome. You are most thank welcome. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next session uh, will be started with the technical. Uh, talk of uh, Professor Kollan Kumar Chattopadhyay. So let me introduce uh, Professor Kollan Kumar Chattopadhyay. So Professor Kollan Kumar Chattopadhyay is at present a professor at the Department of Physics, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. He is also the coordinator of the Nano Science and Technology program of Jadavpur University. His current field of research interest includes transport electronics, carbon nanostructures like CNT and graphene and also various kinds of nanostructured materials and their applications. He is also extensively involved in AB in total calculations using density functions theory. Professor Chattopadhyay has published more than 380 research papers in various international journals of repute and more than 250 papers in the proceedings of national international conferences. His current age index is 51 and has over 11,400 citations. 
he has supervised 38 students to their phd degrees he is the author of four books and several books chapters in the area of physics and nanotechnology and has four patent he is the recipient of the various awards and postdoctoral fellowship including mrsi medal and japan society for Pro uh, promotions of science jsps center of excellence postdoctoral fellowship coe science and technology agency sta fellowship government of japan he received dr magahan shah gold magnat shah gold medal from the uh, acetic society in 2015 and also american chemical society membership award membership award he was elected as fellow of the west bengal academy of science and technology he was a visiting professor at the hyang university south korea nims japan and ulster university uk he is the vice president of mrsi kolkata chapter and life member of many academic bodies like materials research society of india thermophysical society of india iasc iscs etc he is an editor of springer journal journal of material science materials in electronics and an editorial board member of indian journal of physics physics express etc he is in the panel list of expert committee for research project review of european union and singapore science academy so with this short introduction i will invite to professor kollan kumar chattopadhyay for his technical lecture sir thank you dr aniruddha uh, i think am I, I i am audible yes sir you are audible sir you okay. can start now so uh, thank you very much and uh, at the outset i'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me in this uh, advanced hybrid material webinar which is very pertinent in recent context and i'm sorry for some technical glitches uh, that happened since morning and uh, was delayed and uh, already it is late so uh, anyway what i would like to do in this talk is to uh, discuss uh, some of the energy related nanotechnology and uh, some of their applications some of basic issues and we have just listened a very nice lecture on uh, photovoltaic and particularly this perovskite material and use of that as a solar cell uh, so this talk will be little different from uh, that aspect but uh, it's related to energy application of Oh. Now, uh, the plan of the talk is something like this. First of all, I shall very briefly introduce to the uh, energy nanotechnology related work. And then uh, I shall touch upon some of our work related to uh, different energy aspects. First of all, energy saving application. And then I shall move on to energy storage area. Uh, what are the basic ideas and some uh, important result from our group and then I shall touch another very important issue uh, which has come up recently and that is the emergence of negative capacitance what it is and what it is implication in the future technologies that I may touch upon and uh, okay depending on the time I shall touch upon some related areas now uh, as you know that since the introduction of nanotechnology uh, in the early 90s of the last century. So more than three decades have passed. Okay. In this uh, time, we have uh, witnessed, uh, I mean, significant development in the areas of uh, nanomaterial, nanotechnology, and some of the technology, some of the ideas are already commercially available. And uh, particularly in the last decade, the emergence of two dimensional material uh, that have uh, changed the scenario, uh, graphene and graphene based material and other inorganic two dimensional material. So lots of this 2D material uh, have emerged with their uh, tremendous properties. And not only that, some new physics have also been introduced in these materials. So a lot of people are working uh, in this aspect. On the other hand, uh, you know 
that one of the major problem that the civilization is going to face uh, is the energy. Okay? So not only the fossil fuel is going to deplete very soon, but it has also environmental impact that we all know. And that's why energy related research, particularly there are various aspects of energy related research that are very important. For example, the direct production of, uh, I mean, uh, renewable energies like using solar cell or, uh, or, or tapping the natural sources, that uh, is there and many new ideas have also came, for example, multiple exciton generation solar cell, and people are working on it. On the other hand, there are recent uh, tremendous improvement in the generation of thermoelectricity, and uh, not only from solid material, but also you know, from nanofluid, by stable generation of thermal gradient using some nanoparticle in liquid, that has also come in a very big way. People are trying to overcome that uh, figure of merit, uh, I mean limit, in thermoelectric material to generate the power. Then mechanical energy harvesting, for example, by using the piezoelectricity or triboelectricity, using different kind of nanostructure that are also a very important field of research today. So these uh, areas include, I mean, the energy generation. But at the same time, you know that energy storage is a very important area. Uh, for example, solar cell, you know that when we want to use the energy when the sun is not uh, available, for example, in the night time, so we have to store energy. Okay. So that's why the batteries and supercapacitors, those are very important, uh, we all know. And what are the current development and uh, some ideas that we have touch upon. Equally important is the energy saving application. You know that we there is a saying that the money saved equal to money earned. So at the same time, we can say that energy saved equal to energy generated. That means in our daily life, uh, we are using so many kind of energies and most of them are wasted. So if we can reduce the waste okay, by improved technologies, then also uh, this will this will uh, I mean, create great impact in the energy related, uh, I mean, mitigation of environmental impact and other issues. So that's why I shall also touch upon some areas in which the energy saving applications using nanomaterials are there. For example, development of nano lubricants, smart window, nano refrigerant, uh, development of low power consuming uh, display devices. These are all related to energy saving application. And the fifth regime is the, I mean, energy transmission. So that is also an area where a lot of energy get wasted and uh, people are developing, I mean, uh, low loss transmission of energy using superconducting material or good insulating material. So these are some of the areas which are related to energy nanotechnology. I shall touch upon one or two areas in, in uh, energy saving and energy storage application. Okay, so uh, coming to the the efficient display devices. So I just uh, try to discuss a very simple idea what we have developed. Uh, I mean, using graphene. Uh, you know that graphene is a flat two dimensional material, it's well known. But if you just use this graphene. Uh, as it is, for example, uh, on, a, on a flexible substrate or conducting substrate, and then you try to, uh, I mean, uh, pull electron out of it, that is in electron emission application, the performance was not so good. Okay? There are reasons why this is so. I am not going that detail. But what we uh, understood that if we can, first of all, uh, cut the graphene nano plaque into nano ribbon like structure and then create enormous edge state and then we can orient this graphene nano ribbon okay vertically or quasi vertically uh, on the on the uh, graphene substrate then uh, so already i talked about the various aspect of this uh, energy nanotechnology and i mentioned that the uh, five areas 
Uh, briefly, I, I repeat that one. That is the energy uh, conversion. That is energy generation issues. Okay. Then energy generation by using, for example, tribal electricity or grid electricity. There is a mechanical energy resting issue. And then I mentioned that energy storage is equally important using supercapacitor or batteries. And I also mentioned that energy saving is very much important in current uh, days, uh, not only for environmental purposes, but also uh, for, I mean, yes, for reducing pollution and, uh, okay, uh, economical point of view also. So I, I just touch upon these two areas very briefly, that energy saving and energy storage, okay, in today's talk. Now, uh, you can see that I was mentioning that uh, energy saving application include various areas. And uh, for example, development of very low power consuming display technology is very much important from the technological point of view. So here, a very simple idea is presented uh, what we have done. And we uh, try to use graphene, uh, chemically derived graphene uh, as an efficient display device. And what we found that when we uh, just take the graphene flakes and then uh, make thin film of it by electrophoretic deposition on a substrate, then uh, if we use that electrode as a, as a cathode, uh, the performance for electron emission is not so good. So we converted that. Uh, so this is our innovation. We converted that uh, graphene flat flakes or graphene sheet into nano ribbon by plasma cutting. Basically, these uh, substrates are carbon close substrate, conducting substrate, and uh, graphene flakes are deposited electrophoretically. And then these graphene coated carbon fabrics are taken as the power electrode in this, uh, I mean, okay, uh, plasma chamber. And as you know that in plasma chamber, in, in RF plasma, we can generate the cell bias in the power electrode and we can also vary the cell bias. So what happened that due to the negative cell bias development, we can bombard the graphene coated substrate by inert uh, ions like argon okay? and then convert this graphene flakes into this nano ribbon. You can clearly see that the scale is 50 nanometers. So that means each of these graphene nano ribbon is of the order of five to seven nanometer wide and predominantly edge state can be seen. So these are vertically uh, or quasi vertically oriented over the, over the surface of the carbon flake substrate. And by varying the uh, energy, by varying, uh, how we can vary the energy by varying the cell bias, we can vary the energy. And also by varying the pressure, we can uh, vary the ion density. So by these two uh, parameter, we can change the morphology from graphene nano ribbon to kind of nano umbrella like this. And then when we put this uh, converted graphene into the electron emission chamber for measurement, you can see that there is significant improvement. This black uh, plot, the lowest one, this is the current density versus the electric field plot in the, in the uh, electron emission measurement. Uh, and you can see that the performance of the flat graphene was not so good. But when we converted this to graphene nano ribbon, or for example, graphene nano umbrella, by um, adding time, then you can see that uh, the current density significantly improved. It uh, goes to a million per centimeter square, which is sufficient for any good display application. Not only that, the turn on field also downshifted to less than 0.4 volt per micrometer. So this shows that uh, by using, by converting this graphene nano flake to this uh, structure, such structure, we can use it for efficient display devices. I am not going that detail, only uh, presenting the main idea. So if more detail are necessary, one can consult this, uh, some of these our earlier papers. Equally important, for example, the development of uh, the other semiconductor material in nanostructure form. And here uh, we have shown that uh, by very simple idea, very simple idea, any college level laboratory can do it. 
that we can produce this type of very good zinc oxide nanotetrapod. And uh, our idea was that uh, we can take, for example, zinc foil, and then we, we cover it by uh, gold film over it. And then uh, in open air furnace at a particular temperature, if we heat this, and then uh, basically if we just uh, release the pressure of the gold foil by piercing it through some pin, then you can get beautiful this zinc oxide nanotetrapod. And by controlling the gold uh, film thickness, we can control the pong length. For example, here, the, the stock panel rightmost is, shows the uh, long form zinc oxide tetrapod, and these are the short form, which is clearly seen in the inset of this figure. These are the cathodoluminescence okay, uh, CL figure, CL imaging figure. You can see that in the short form, there is no dark region okay, in the in the zinc oxide tetrapod, whereas in the large form region, you can see at the center that uh, there is uh, I mean, some dark region that indicates that the the generation of stacking fault in the dark in the in the long form nanotetrapod. So uh, the beauty of this kind of structure, you can see here that the cathodoluminescence, uh, the the CL spectra, the cathodoluminescence spectra. You see the pink color plot is basically from the short form uh, pink oxide tetrapod, and where there is no defect related emission. As you can see also clearly in the CL imaging that there is no stacking fault, so significantly low defect. So direct fabrication of laser is possible by using this type of structure. And uh, for the long form, you can clearly see that along with the band to band transition, there is a defect related feature. Okay? Now we can also use this uh, tetrapod by making hybrid material with graphene. Okay? And uh, for example, if we take the uh, big graphene play, uh, which is shown here. And then we incorporate this graphene flake by spin coating into this nanotetrapod. So we get a composite material. It is uh, graphene wrapped nanotetrapod. Okay. And then if we just put this material into your the electron emission setup, taking this hybrid material as a cathode, you can see the tremendous improvement of the electron emission performance in terms of increase in current density as well as downshifting of the, uh, the turn on field. Okay. These are some characterization data which indicates that the good crystallinity of this tetrapod and the XPS result also indicate the, the uh, purity and uh, one can calculate the, the oxidation state of the different element and so on. So this shows that by uh, varying the structure by incorporating this into uh, two dimensional material like graphene, one can use such material for very good electron emission display purposes, low power consuming electron emission purposes. Then, just another application, as I was uh, telling that, first of all, I shall touch upon some energy saving application. You can, you can see that uh, we have generated this copper iodide nanocrystal by some a very simple chemical route. And then this copper iodide nanocrystal, we have incorporated this into uh, the graphene matrix. Okay? You can clearly see the uh, copper iodide nanocrystal incorporated graphene here. Okay? And when this hybrid material was put under uh, electron bombardment, uh, you can see, for example, in the cathodoluminescent setup, you can see that when these was bombarded by uh, electron, then strong red luminescence actually generated. Okay, so this was for, this work was highlighted by this journal uh, in their cover page. So this is a new kind of phosphor, copper iodide RGO phosphor for field emission display, low power display application. So uh, that was developed by using very simple idea. Then uh, Anirudh, the slide is visible. Visible, sir. Mm, there is no problem, sir. Okay. There is no problem. Okay. Then, uh, as you know, that the future fuel uh, will be surely going to be hydrogen, and uh, the water is the most abundant source for this uh, hydrogen generation by electrochemical water splitting. 
so uh, many research is going on to to generate efficient uh, i mean uh, hydrogen uh, by water splitting and uh, most important uh, catalyst for these are you know this uh, ruthenium based catalyst but those are very costly so whether some a low cost uh, material can be fabricated so that's that's why i mean we are also working on this generation of good electrochemical water splitting catalyst and just one result from that when we cobalt incorporated nickel sulfide catalyst uh, i mean we have investigated and you see that these are the, the current density versus potential plot and this is the the uh, i mean purple one is basically from the platinum so comparable performance of course the platinum is the best one as you can see that this this uh, i mean slope is 30 millivolt per decade is the best for uh, platinum but this cobalt incorporated nickel sulfide is showing about 46 millivolt per decade so it's not so far from this one okay so uh, these are some areas uh, where uh, research is going on uh, related to energy uh, energy saving application now coming to some storage issue you know that uh, this i mean uh, in 2013 okay this is just to indicate that how the uh, market for super capacitor research is coming in a very big way uh, you know that in 2013 you can see that the battery market uh, was about 95 billion us dollar per year and uh, this side you can see that the standard uh, electrolytic capacitor or uh, electrostatic capacitor those are used for passive circuit element okay and uh, normal oscillation purposes so those was about 17 billion us dollar per year but in between these two there is a very small uh, region you can see that this was the market for super capacitor in 2013 about 0.4 billion us dollar but then if you look at the uh, below bar diagram you can see that from 2014 there is a rapid growth of the uh, super capacitor market that is coming and it has crossed more than 2000 million us dollar so it very i mean increasing very rapidly uh, soon now why this is so the reason is that uh, if you if you just compare the 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 performance of the battery uh, or fuel cell with that of the electrolytic capacitor you can see that can be best judged by the so called ragon plot for this energy density versus the power density plot you can see here that the uppermost uh, i mean uh, this this region okay the uppermost left corner uh, this is the region where lithium ion battery and fuel cell they actually reside so they are uh, they have very high energy density but you know that their power density is very low on the other hand if you look at the other extreme that is the electrolytic capacitor or electrostatic capacitor so they have very high uh, i mean power density but their energy density is low so to bridge this gap there is a region um, probably this is the region where we can have the both i mean facilities for example um, moderately high energy density and moderately high power density so that is actually the region of super capacitor and uh, the super capacitor why people are trying to utilize super capacitor for various purposes there are very uh, important issues regarding uh, the the uh, battery research as you know although you know that uh, that almost all the mobile devices nowadays it laptop mobile phone we cannot think of without battery so lithium and battery mostly so that is there but at the same time for heavy duty applications if you require high power particularly in some uh, cars automobiles or in airplanes then uh, the battery is a, a potential uh, threat or, or, or danger because there are many incidents when this explosion took place the fire took place and there are many report on the tesla model of the car and even in the boeing uh, uh, i mean airlines so uh, they have to downgrade their uh, i mean aircraft for month uh, issues uh, related to issues with battery so that's why uh, you know that uh, some issues of battery research are there for example even after long research 
the uh, issue regarding the generation of dendrite formation on the electrode that has not been resolved in battery. So they cause actually the local generation of uh, high resistance and that cause prevent the heating locally and that may cause fire. So these are the uh, reasons why people are trying to save from battery to develop supercapacitor because they are extremely safe. Supercapacitor, if this energy density or power density could be optimized, then they are extremely safe more than, uh, I mean, several million uh, cycle of operation is possible without any, any uh, problem. So that is the importance of this uh, supercapacitor research and significant improvement has already been achieved in this area. Uh, now I just show, okay, particularly uh, the combination of the supercapacitor with that of the other, uh, I mean, issues, for example, uh, you, you including fuel cell, this hybrid mode of power uh, would be the best combination. And this is an article uh, where we have shown that basically during this heavy duty application, for example, such type of crane, okay, when they lift this uh, goods, they they have to momentarily apply very large power. On the other hand, if we use uh, when we use the brakes in automobiles, uh, then also lots of energy is wasted. So whether it is possible to utilize this wasted power to generate energy uh, by utilizing supercapacitor, uh, so that is also a very important area of research. Now coming to some uh, very um, uh, basic issues of supercapacitors, you know, these supercapacitors mainly are of two types. One is called the electric double layer uh, capacitor, and mostly the carbon based material are used there. And another is the pseudo capacitor where the Faraday processes take place, and mostly the oxide materials. Okay? And for example, conducting polymer, they are good candidate as you. Okay? Now, the, the hybrid of these two, combining EDLC and pseudo capacitor, so that is actually the concept of asymmetric supercapacitor, where people can utilize both the advantages of EDLC and pseudo capacitor, and uh, then uh, significant improvement of the uh, specific capacitance, the uh, charging discharging time, etc., could be obtained. So these are uh, some of the areas in which intense research is going on. Okay. And uh, these are some basic issues related to what are the differences between supercapacitor and battery. One can see that ideal supercapacitor, the CV plot is a rectangle one. And uh, you can see that in case of battery, there are prominent anodic and cathodic peak. Okay. And uh, you, can, you can calculate the specific capacitance from the uh, charging discharging plot or from the CV plot. Quickly, uh, just to show some important results, uh, for example, you know this, uh, the selecting of material uh, for the supercapacitor application is very important and whether we should use uh, single material or we use the hybrid kind of material that also has to be judged. So I first saw uh, some result using this quaternary chalcogenide and uh, then okay uh, I, I, I'll show some other result related to super uh, capacitor development. So basically you know this uh, castorite and stannite structure particularly this copper zinc tin sulfide. So these structures were uh, proposed by uh, these materials are proposed by some Japanese group uh, probably in 2013 uh, for photovoltaic material. Okay. And many people uh, I mean, jumped into this field because these are all earth abundant material, so low cost material, and uh, significant uh, improvement in the uh, photovoltaic conversion efficiency was also reported. But when we looked into this material, we found that the beauty of this material is particularly that the cations, that is the uh, G, um, G, T, copper, they have the different kind of oxidation states. So we found, we thought that maybe this material will be suitable for uh, uh, the, the supercapacitor application also. So we tried to investigate the supercapacitive application or electrochemical performance of such material. And 
we have prepared this material by chemical route. I am not going that detail. So by chemical route and then by hydrothermal method, we have incorporated the nanoparticles of this quaternary chalcogenide onto the graphene surface so that we prepare this quaternary chalcogenide RGO nanocomposite okay, by suitable hydrothermal technique. And if somebody is interested, then uh, uh, you can, I mean, have a look at this paper. Then uh, we investigated at first the, the uh, characterization, whether the material is of correct phase uh, for the composition, for the quality of the graphene, etc. By standard technique, like X-ray diffraction studies, the Raman spectroscopic studies, all this indicated that the material is a very good quality, both the zinc oxide, I mean, uh, the quaternary chalcogenide and the graphene. And okay, this is the FESCM image. You can clearly see that this nanoparticle, okay, and uh, when this was incorporated in the graphene flakes, clearly you can see that the particles get attached from the uh, graphene sheet. These are the edX composition. And the TM, uh, you can clearly see that uh, good crystalline, uh, from the lattice image, you can see that the good crystallinity of this particle okay, and uh, on the graphene sheet and composition also there. And in detail, this uh, extra photoelectron spectroscopy was performed to find out uh, again the composition and the kind of, uh, I mean, the uh, oxidation state. So I'm not doing that detailed analysis. But the main important result is the electrochemical performance of this, I mean, quaternary chalcogenide with graphene uh, waste hybrid material. Now look at the CV plot, okay, of this one at various scan, uh, scan rate. And you can clearly see uh, from the, the A is basically only quaternary chalcogenide. But when this was incorporated into the graphene matrix, you see that significantly the area uh, of the graph actually is, and also the Faraday peaks, okay, uh, that got enhanced with the increased conductivity, you can clearly see that the, the, uh, the scale here is, is increased. So that's indicate that uh, the increase of the capacitance and when we calculated the specific capacitance from this CV uh, plot, so this black uh, actually bar indicate the specific capacitance for the only quaternary chalcogenide. And this uh, the brown uh, bar actually indicate the specific capacitance uh, for the, the composite, the, the hybrid material, quaternary chalcogenide with the RGO. Significant improvement has been achieved, you can see. And then we can do other analysis like Nyquist analysis to find out the resistivity, et cetera. And then uh, the charging discharging is very important because you know from the CV plot, there is always some overestimation of the specific capacitance, but uh, the capacitance value that we get from charging discharging is the more uh, useful for practical purposes. And uh, you can see that here, the only quaternary chalcogenide and then graphene incorporated one. And from that, the specific capacitance was calculated. We investigated the cycle stability. Here, uh, 2000 cycles were shown, but later we have extended this to 10,000 cycles and uh, the retentivity is nearly 95%. Initially, you can see that interestingly, that uh, initially the, uh, I mean, the cycle number, the, the uh, capacitance retention increases. Now, the reason for this is that uh, after some cycle of operation, almost all the area of the electro, uh, electron material, uh, I mean, the electrolyte uh, got access to all the areas, and that's why the uh, capacitance retention actually uh, increased. Okay, so uh, similarly, then uh, those, those are the three electrode uh, data, and now we can fabricate the actual device, okay, with the, with the uh, asymmetric supercapacitor fabrication. For example, then we have to take the other electrode as activated carbon and uh, the, uh, the counter electrode is basically our material that is the quaternary chalcogenite with our GO. So these are the separate CV plot. And then at various window, you can see the CV plot of the device. This is the charging discharging and this is how it looks, uh, the actual device, how it looks. Then these are the actual photograph, and we can combine this supercapacitor in 
series or parallel combination according to our requirement. And then uh, this is the combined performance. You see here, it's very important plot that uh, these are some references okay, which uh, in very good journals. Uh, the detail can be found in our paper. And this is the, I mean, this is our work. This is the result obtained in this work. So it is very, uh, I mean, competitive and uh, better with most of the published result. And using this device, we have actually uh, been able to uh, run some fan. Uh, we have video, but because of time, and I'm not playing that. So you can see that the fan get rotated, and also uh, we can ignite several LED, our university logo, and so on. So this is actually the video. I'm not playing. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, then we investigated that whether instead of, I mean, uh, without graphene, if we just play with the structure and morphology of this copper nickel tin sulfide, SNTA, as we call, then how will be the performance? So basically, uh, we have synthesized the different nanostructure of this copper nickel tin sulfide nanomaterial. And now we play with the morphology. So here you can see that flake-like structure, which is able to give some microsphere, uh, and those individual flakes have few nanometer thickness, those are fabricated. And then in detail, we have characterized that one by the microscopy, uh, extra diffractometer, and we varied actually the different condition to, to vary the uh, I mean, thickness of the individual flakes and so on. This is both morphology. And now this is the performance of, of the uh, electrochemical performance. Again, you can see the, the current density versus, I mean, CV plot. And we have calculated the specific capacitance, which comes to be very high, about more than 1600 at low scan rate. And naturally, at higher scan rate, the specific capacitance goes down. So this was, again, a similarly uh, device was fabricated uh, using copper uh, nickel tin sulfide with one electrode and activated carbon with another electrode, and all the related studies are performed. Okay. So, so the uh, essence is that without using graphene, by playing with the morphology, this type of quaternary uh, chalcogenide can also be used as energy storage application. Uh, we investigated other nanomaterial, for example, this cobalt oxide nano wire on flexible uh, substrate like carbon floor and beautiful nanostructure could be obtained as you can see here there's grass like very good quality and crystalline material was obtained on the on the carbon uh, fabric okay and uh, detailed characterization confirmed the good quality of the structure and then again we performed this electrochemical performance studies and uh, the specific capacitance etc calculated and we have also uh, use this for, uh, I mean, as a device performance. And one interesting point about this is this is fully flexible. We have investigated the CV plot under bending condition, almost 180 degree bending condition, and uh, that uh, so nearly the same, not deteriorated under bending. So this is flexible capacitor application. Also, this is a very good uh, one. And uh, you can see that uh, LEDs are ignited by using such supercapacitor. Okay. We can, my student also run some clocks and other uh, simple uh, devices or batteries are used. Instead, uh, we are using the supercapacitor. Now, going to uh, extending this idea, actually, we were, uh, I mean, literally playing with the morphology. Actually, my students are very uh, efficient in, in uh, preparing the, the control nanostructure, you can appreciate the control and uh, beauty of this uh, nanostructure via 2D, 2D assembly of copper, cobalt oxide, and MnO2. Okay, So MnO2 flakes over copper, cobalt oxide flakes that were deposited. And then uh, it was, I mean, the, the synthesis was tuned to obtain this nano cactus like structure. You can see that one. 2D layer over another 2D, and then the spikes are created by controlled manner to increase the surface area and to check the electrochemical performance. Okay. So uh, this result, uh, I mean, 
is not yet fully published, so that's why not fully disclosing here, but the very interesting uh, results are obtained okay, in this work also. And where uh, you can you can have uh, a large number of LED, et cetera, can be ignited by this one. We can also, I mean, fabricate such type of supercapacitor using vanadium oxide. Uh, that is also a transmission metal oxide, and it is expected to show a good performance. So that is also a uh, bit. So uh, I think uh, the time is running short. So I take another maybe four or five minutes to, to introduce you to that uh, negative capacitance related some work and without going much detail. Uh, the most important thing, as you know, that uh, I mean in electronic devices, particularly in, in uh, the uh, MOSFET, etc., for low power electronic application, the data rent is basically the so-called Boltzmann tyranny. And what is that? If you look at this IDS versus VGS characteristics, you can see that this is the 60 millivolt per decade. So that is the limit, and uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, go below that one. So that is the so-called Boltzmann tyranny, which is basically is a deterrent to show uh, for uh, higher speed and for low power electronics. So how to work up this one? So many propositions are there, but one of the most attractive propositions is basically uh, whether one can use the negative capacitance. And uh, there are actually uh, two aspects of negative capacitance. One is related to ferroelectric material. And uh, another is basically whether the conventional semiconductor, okay, for example, compound semiconductor, particularly the metal oxide semiconductor, that can be utilized to generate the negative capacitance. So uh, we are mostly interested in using the second one, that, that means the oxide semiconductor to use as a negative capacitance material. By the way, a lot of research is also going on whether uh, and what will be the implication of this negative capacitance on the supercapacitance performance also. Anyway, so this idea actually came to us, uh, I, I mean, negative capacitance, people are working for quite some time, but this uh, specifically what uh, we have contributed that I, uh, I mean, want to emphasize maybe within uh, one or two minutes. So basically, we are trying to realize the P-type zinc oxide, as many people uh, are also trying. And you know the uh, main difficulty in realizing the P-type zinc oxide is that it is not stable. I mean, you can obtain P-type zinc oxide by suitable doping, but uh, after some time, it again becomes N-type because you know it's a predominantly N-type material. So we uh, actually collected the, a lot of paper. Uh, I mean, what are the uh, I mean, published paper? So just a glimpse of a uh, few, uh, the P-type realization of P-type zinc oxide. So our idea was that instead of doping at the cationic site, if we can uh, reduce the electronegativity of the anionic site, that means if we can reduce the uh, electronegativity at the oxygen site, then maybe realization of P-type zinc oxide would be, uh, I mean, easier. Now we tried to do that, but as you know, it's not easy to, to dope at the ironic site, but uh, we achieved that one by uh, two method. One is, uh, I mean, uh, the concealed annealing uh, in, in appropriate chalcogen atmosphere, and another is by, uh, I mean, in thin film by chemical vapor deposition. So the CVD result I am not discussing today, but basically this uh, zinc oxide, some of the zinc oxide, I mean, the oxygen atom of the zinc oxide was replaced by chalcogen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. Okay, and uh, we call that it is anionic site of zinc oxide. Okay? And then uh, to check that whether this really uh, this anionic site doping was achieved. We have performed in detail these uh, Rydvelt analysis. You can clearly see, and uh, from here uh, also you can confirm that yes, chalcogen atom occupy the correct lattice site, replacing some of the oxygen. And then experimentally, also XPS measurement was performed, which indicate that yes, anionic site is, uh, I mean, really doped by some chalcogen, and then. Uh, the detailed characterization was also performed, and we have extensively 
uh, utilize the density function of theory based ab initio calculation uh, to investigate that what's happening. Uh, okay, not going that detail here, but just this is a uh, electron localization function plot where you can see that when this red atom is the oxygen atom and this yellow atom is the sulfur atom. When we replace some of the oxygen atom by sulfur atom, you see this is the I mean region where you can see that electron deficiency. That means here is locally uh, the, the whole delocalization has taken place. Okay, So that means uh, you can visualize the material as uh, n type matrix with local pockets of p type region. Now, this type of material actually when we have a otherwise n type matrix with local uh, I mean, pockets of p type region. So there both the recombination and uh, generation, carrier generation goes on. And if recombination exceeds the generation, then we can get the negative capacity. So this was actually the key idea and that we investigated in detail. And you can see here the very interesting result of this anionic side of zinc oxide. This is the capacitance versus frequency plot. The uh, A panel actually gives the normal undoped zinc oxide. Okay. Undoped zinc oxide, and you can see that normal dispersion as it is expected, capacitance versus frequency plot, and that should be at different bias voltages, and that is obtained. But as soon as we introduce some sulfur to the oxygen site, you can see that the capacitance in this region, okay, they actually, uh, I mean, shows the negative behavior. Okay. This data is repeated uh, for many times and it is more prominent when, uh, for example, instead of sulfur, we introduce selenium, as you can see in the C figure of the left panel. You see that negative region is more prominent and the switching takes place. For example, it starts from the negative, goes increasing, and then suddenly at some frequency, it goes to the positive and follow the normal dispersion. If we just zoom this deportion and the, show the inset, you can clearly see the uh, behavior of the data. The phenomena or the observation is more prominent in the tellurium based system. You can clearly see here that the D panel of the, uh, the rightmost uh, region, and you can see that this region shows the prominent uh, negative capacitance so for a more wider range of frequency. And if you look at the, the, the loss peak, normalized loss peak, you can see that the negative capacitance arises when the uh, loss peak is maximum. And some more interesting thing about this is that uh, the data are not scattered. Actually, if you just take this portion and separately and try to fit some model, it is clearly showing that it is following the universal D by relaxation model. Okay? So then we can extract some parameter like this uh, tau, etc., and uh, we explain this. Okay, so this is the paper uh, where we have uh, published this result, and uh, we believe that uh, this is a very important uh, result because uh, here the concept of anionic side doping to achieve negative capacity in the semiconductor that was actually uh, explained, and then the, there were many other questions as actually. The negative capacity is a very, uh, I mean, uh, novel phenomena, and uh, we tried to uh, develop some uh, more general model out of it. But uh, this work, uh, I mean, uh, require more detail uh, discussion and much more time. So I am not going that detail. But uh, we have actually been able to, uh, I mean, formulate uh, uh, overall model to incorporate both the ferroelectric related negative capacitance and the semiconductor related negative capacitance. So we have actually proposed a model. I'm skipping this uh, because of the time. So uh, this is actually the paper. If somebody is interested, then one can uh, have a look that this general model where both the ferroelectric based uh, negative capacitance and the semiconductor based, where, uh, I mean, given in a common uh, level to, to explain what's happening there. Okay, so uh, I think I have taken my time and uh, to conclude, 
that basically i have uh, i mean presented some of the work related to energy aspect of nanotechnology i mentioned that uh, in some areas you can use energy saving application uh, of using nanomaterial for example one can generate very efficient energy efficient display technology one can uh, use for example nano lubricant and uh, so these energy saving applications are also very important and secondly i uh, have touched upon the uh, some result on the supercapacitor energy storage application particularly how the earth abundant uh, quaternary charcoal genide can be utilized with graphene hybrid material or without graphene standalone material by uh, optimizing the morphology as a supercapacitor asymmetric supercapacitor application and finally i touched uh, just the emergence of negative capacitance and also introduce you to the the idea of anionic site doping to induce negative capacitance in uh, the very well known zinc oxide nanomaterial okay so with this i think i i thank the different funding agencies for their kind support and uh, whatever work i have presented are due to my uh, research scholars and uh, this is my group also this is a little old photograph some of them are already at various places in abroad with post or some are doing job uh, and some of us with me and uh, with this i think i thank you for your kind attention thank you sir uh, for your nice talk and Uh, very detailed technical discussions about the different kind of nanostructure materials for the future applications as well as for the sustainability of the materials and environment so the session is open for the questions we can quickly take two or three questions uh, regarding this technical talk please Uh, anybody you have any questions or you can directly contact with professor chakraborty uh, uh, professor kollan kumar chattopadhyay uh, by his mail or you can contact with me i can provide you the phone number or mail whatever it may be so i think there is no question sir Just okay you. <laughs> okay sir uh, Okay. So where are your students? Where are you going? Sir, students participants are. <laughs> sir, students are there. Uh, few. Some of the students, few students are there, sir. Few students are there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So um, uh, now we'll stop here. and the next technical sessions will be started at 4 o'clock so i'll request to all to uh, be sharp appear in the ms team in the same link for the technical sessions which will be started at 4 o'clock and that will be started by professor mohammad henini from nottingham university thank you to all hello sir yeah yeah you have any question Yes, sir. So I was. Yes, please, uh, please, carry on. Please, carry on, sir. sir I have one question. Uh, sir, yeah, can sure, you? Yeah, sure. I'm new to this field. So, can you explain the S deposited uh, technique? How you have uh, like used for uh, that one for Which germanium? So S. Uh, so I uh, saw there there it was written the S synthesize uh, graphene oxide. So. so Can you explain yeah. the results for that? Yes, sir. I got your point. See, uh, the graphene. Uh, when we mentioned this RGO, this this means the chemically reduced graphene. So those are basically obtained by standard Hammers method and by modified Hammers method. But when you get this, you get in the suspended liquid, okay? uh, and then you have to reduce it by appropriate reducing agent. Reducing agent of various kind, maybe hydrogen hydride or something like that. but the point is you get those graphene flakes as suspended in liquid now for any application you have to make the graphene as a thin film form on substrate how you can do that so that can be done by uh, 
uh, a technique called electrophoretic deposition. So basically, you have to take a conducting substrate as an electrode, and then graphene flake dispersed liquid as your uh, medium, and then you have to have a counter electrode, maybe a carbon electrode like that. So when we apply very low voltage between these two electrodes, the carbon electrode and the electrode on which you need the deposition, and then we apply basically uh, the, the potential gradient, then what happens, the graphene flakes, they are always negatively charged. So they will come to the positive charge electrode and get, you get a coating of the graphene flakes over your electrode. So by this method, this is called the electrophoretic method, you can get a thin film of suspended nanoparticle or na particularly for nanoflex is very good technique. And uh, graphene is no problem because graphene has at the edges the charge side. But if it's, I mean, your material is uncharged, then you have to introduce some kind of charge by selecting appropriate material in the electrolyte. So by this way, you can generate or you can fabricate the films of graphene on a substrate. And then basically that graphene film coated substrate was taken in the plasma chamber and bombarded by the argon plasma to convert it into from flex to that kind of nano ribbon. So that was mentioned. I think probably this was your question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have understood. Thank you so much, sir. Any more sir, questions can, from... Sir, uh, can you show 31 and 41 number slide? Yeah. Okay, then go back. Just let me check. Thirty-one. You mean this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, this is actually a schematic to explain the growth mechanism of the. Uh, microsphere consisting of the nanoflex of the quaternary chalcogenide. This copper nickel tin sulfide, those flakes, I mean, assembled to uh, give rise to this kind of microsphere structure. But how this is happening? So, you know, this growth uh, mechanism of any morphology, that's, that is some types of, you can call it speculation, because you do not to know exactly what's happening in your hydrothermal setup there uh, because you do not have that data that from your initial pickers are what's happening. So this is some sort of, uh, I mean, guess, but of course that should have some basis. So basically the time varying experiment was performed and then a large number of sample was investigated under microscope. And for example, you deposit for a few minutes and then you take the image and you take the X-ray diffraction, increase the time for your synthesis, again take the XRD and go back to microscopy. So by collecting this type of information, you can have some flowchart that what's happening, that is called a growth model. So that is one proposed here. But any growth mechanism, not only in our work, in anybody's published paper, you cannot confidently say that it is actually going on there. So it is some kind of, as I said, the speculation is there. Any growth mechanism, unless it is totally done in a controlled atmosphere, like in situ growth with microscopy, etc. So any growth mechanism is a proposed growth mechanism. Okay, this I think, this one, and another you said 40? 41, sir. This one. Is it 41, this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, this one. What do you want to know here? Sir, about the like plot, the volumetric energy and power density plot. Okay. Again, this is a, you see, this is a Ragon plot. So energy density, we calculated from your CV plot and then power density we calculated. And this red portion is our data for different sample. And uh, I mean, but here you see we have compared this, I mean, with the thin film battery, a 4 microampere lithium ion battery. This is commercially available lithium ion battery with that of other, for example, commercial supercapacitor. This is uh, this, this middle portion 
circular region is the data commercial asymmetric supercapacitor. Okay. And this is just for electrolytic capacitor. So with respect to these three, we have shown the performance of our work. If you want to more detail about this, then you can consult this. This paper is already published. You can have a look. Thank you so much, sir. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I think so, sir. There is no questions more. So we can contact with uh, Professor later on. So thank you, sir, again uh, for your nice talk and very detailed discuss technical discussions on the materials. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Anil. Of the oral Algeria, he went to Nottingham University and was awarded the PhD degree in 1984. Muhammad has over 25 years of experience in molecular beam epitaxy growth. His particular specialty in the physics and technology of MB growth for 3.5 electronics and optoelectronic devices. He has authored and co-authored over 930 papers in international journals and conference proceedings. He has a age index of 53. He is the founder of two international conferences, namely low dimensional structures and devices and epitaxial semiconductors on patterned substrates and novel index surfaces. He, is, he edited six books uh, which were published by Elzevar and serves on the editorial board of several scientific journals. He is editor of Journal of Ally and Compounds Elzevar. So with this nice and very short introductions about the Professor Muhammad Henini, I will invite him uh, to start his uh, technical session. Sir, please start your uh, lecture. Thank you very much, Mondal, for this uh, introduction. And thank you as well for inviting me to give this um, uh, seminar. Um, uh, uh, it's my pleasure and it's nice as well to see you guys. So what I thought to do today, you know, because I don't know the audience, so I'm just pitching the, the, the seminar or the talk uh, to a general audience. So the purpose of my talk is made to, to show you some really advanced uh, semiconductor materials, mainly for application in photovoltaics. And I will show you what are the opportunities and the challenges of introducing this new kind of materials in order to improve, for example, the efficiency of solar cells. So let me just start with this slide, uh, which is really important, actually, because, uh, you know, um, whatever we do in the lab, we call it basic research. And this usually we rely on this periodic table. And for the purpose of this talk today, you know, you will know that materials are extremely important. We use materials every day, whether metal, whether uh, uh, um, uh, uh, semiconductors, or whether, you know, um, uh, uh, high resistivity materials, plastic, and so on. But today I will be maybe talking about this group three and the group five. So this, for example, semiconductors are based on gallium and arsenic, for example, gallium, aluminium and arsenic. So these are, you know, compound made of the group three metals and the group five, you say. Of course, you are all familiar with silicon, uh, which is actually used quite a lot in solar cells, uh, you say. But the solar cells that I'm not going to discuss today, they will base, be based mainly on this uh, group three and the group five. And all the time, the challenge is how actually to go from the basic research to applied research. You can make wonderful devices in the lab, but is it really how to apply those devices uh, commercially is really difficult. Uh, so I will show you today, you know, how this solar cells, you know, um, uh, roadmap um, has progressed with time. So let me first start with this slide. Uh, to show you the importance of solar cells. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> so, as some probably, for most of you probably wouldn't remember this, you know, probably you're all too young to remember this, but this is actually the first Sputnik which went around the Earth, orbiting the Earth, in around in the late 1950s. 
uh, you say, so it went around the earth and each time it, it sent a beep, 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 beep. Okay, so this was the first Sputnik which went, went around the earth, uh, orbiting the, the earth from, uh, from Russia. Of course, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the same time, you know, uh, just a few years later, uh, you know, the Americans actually launched as well what they call the Vanguard One. And it's actually the first solar, solar uh, power satellite. And you will see in this, in this uh, diagram, in this image here, this is actually the solar cell. Because of course, you know, this uh, satellite has got, uh, you know, equipment there which all need to be powered by electricity. And how can you generate electricity when you're in space? So you need something to convert, in this case, uh, the sunlight uh, to electricity, and that's how these solar cells work. And this was very, very low power, as you can see, so it was only five milliwatts. But please notice here the size of these uh, solar cells is also around, around one or two centimeters uh, by one or two centimeters, because it, there wasn't much equipment to power, and you didn't need too much power. So remember the size, and as well, see the time scale. This is now uh, nearly early 1960s not a long time ago, it's about 60 years ago. And this actually really uh, set, uh, you know, a very, very big wave in, in the news, saying because, of course, this solar cell was based on silicon, as I showed you here before. Silicon is very, very popular. It was based on silicon, and of course, uh, you know, the media really picked up on this and say, vast power of sun is tapped by battery using sand ingredient because you know silicon is practically made of sand very very refined sand and that's what you know they thought now we've got a solution to our power uh, uh, the bones were our power hungry we need a lot of power and we got plenty of sand on earth so we're gonna have really no problem to generate power using sand, in other words, using silicon, you see. So this was the main, as I said, solar, the main power source in space. So this was very, very important. But look at the size in here, it's very, very small. And the basic silicon, silicon solar size is very, very simple. All you have, <coughs> you, you have a PN junction, a PN junction, you know, this is kind of semiconductors which make of a P-type uh, semiconductor, N-type semiconductor. And all you do, you put some kind of metals on the top, you know, a, a contact on the top and contact at the bottom in order to apply a voltage. And therefore, when you shine the light through this grid, which are metal, you know, and you excite some electrons and holes, therefore you can create a, a voltage and you create a current going through the system. So this is practically free energy. You just shine light and you get electricity. So you don't need anything. So it's really clean and it is available uh, as well. So it's very, very simple. It's a PN junction, you reverse bias, it shine light, and you got uh, electricity out of it. We'll just show you here, and one of the very important things in solar cells, whatever solar cells, is the e efficiency. You know, of course, the efficiency is one, the maximum efficiency you can get is about 100%, but you look here at the efficiency of the silicon, you know, it's only around 16 to 20%. And even with time, as you can see here, this hasn't improved very, 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 very much. Uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, silicon uh, uh, solar cells uh, have a very low uh, efficiency, around 20%, you know, the best, 20, 24%, the best silicon solar cells. Uh, so here I'm just going to show you, uh, you know, uh, a, a very, a very uh, uh, important diagram. Actually, this one actually is now, this diagram is going to 2050. I've just, this is just show you, uh, you know, the trend of the different materials and with different efficiency. Here I'm plotting the efficiency as a function of time. Okay. But look at the efficiency of some semiconductors, of some semiconductors, for example, here that's what we call the group three, five. Look at the efficiency with time. You know, over 20 years, you know, they're practically, you know, going from something like 25 to around 44, 45% efficiency. The silicon, as you can see here, this is the silicon trend. The silicon has not changed much. It's the best you can do is around, uh, you know, 20, 24% efficiency. 
Okay, so the best solar cells are made of the group C5. And of course, there are many other new solar cells come to, 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 to you know, people are working on different materials, perovskites, you know, and you can see some of these are shown here, some oxide uh, layers, but nothing which can compete with these three, five semiconductors, which are around about 46% efficiency. So, so silicon is very important, but unfortunately it doesn't deliver the efficiency people need for some applications. Now, let me just show you uh, you know, the, the, you know, uh, uh, these solar cells with time we can we just show you the size, how this have increased because of course this, uh, you know, station, because from now on, I will gonna base my, myself on using the solar cell in space. And of course, because in space, there is nothing, you have to generate some electricity somehow, and uh, solar is very, very important. But just please look at this uh, size, which was about one or two centimeters uh, square, uh, as you can see, 958, and look at their size now. Look at these panels. They are huge panels. Just look at these two gentlemen here, and it just shows you uh, the size of this. So the most important things here is how actually to get a very high solar efficiency. And I will explain to you the reason why efficiency is very, very important in space. It's extremely important because you can see the size of this are increasing all the time uh, because the station are getting bigger and bigger and they need more power to 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 to, to, to drive those equipments so here just to give you a, an example why efficiency is extremely important why you need to improve efficiency so let's just take it for for example for space <clears throat> so if you for example, you need X kilowatt, for example, to drive this uh, 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 station and using a, a silicon, you, you say using silicon, you probably need, just an example, about 16 meters of solar panel made of silicon. How far if you increase the, the efficiency of these solar cells, say, for example, for the 3.5 semiconductor, which are around 40% efficiency, you can decrease this, this size of this panel by a factor of three. So you see from 16 meters to about five meters because they are more efficient than the silicon, silicon one. <clears throat> you see, and that is very important because this reduces the size and you, you reduce the weight for, of spacecraft because you, you need less uh, 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 solar cells. You know, they are smaller, more compact, which generate <coughs> you know, a great uh, efficiency uh, power. So, so this is are usually tandem solar cells, which deliver around, uh, you know, 30%. Tandem solar cells, that means there are two cells, one on top of the other, yeah, because you would never get one single cell, which gives you 40% efficiency. So this is what you I will explain, uh, you know, uh, uh, later on, how we can improve the efficiency of solar cells, uh, you know, uh, by stacking more than one cell on top of each other. But just is look here again at this uh, you know space station which are already in space and look how many panels they need of course and you can see if you reduce these sizes by factor of three that's amazing in terms of uh, 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 weight and payload to send this to space as well now let me just you know show you for example you know the, the, the spectrum the telesa spectrum of the sun so this is what the sun energy gives you so I'm just putting the energy here, and you can see there are some peaks at certain energies. You see here uh, around one electron volt, and here all practically near near uh, near uh, the visible here near the infrared. So, but there are some dips, as you can see. So, so, so you can see there are already some energies in 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 this uh, spectrum which you would like to exploit in order to shine them on the solar cells and they get electricity. Of course, if you use this energy here, practically good, probably nothing, all this energy, all this energy. So you have practically to select the solar cell to be practically you know, active in some of these uh, energies uh, when you shine light on them. Okay. So this is what you do. For example, if you've got one single solar cells, you can exploit this part of this uh, spectrum, of the, of the solar spectrum. OK, so you exploit this one cell and you can divide practically this spectrum in different different uh, ranges. So you can use one cell which will be active for this region and other cells will be active in this region and other cells will be active in this region. So here you can see 
I am I'm trying to exploit all this energy in the sun by stacking different material systems which will absorb a certain energies from the spectrum. And that's what we call them as a single cell, a tandem cell, that means two cells, or a, 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 a three junction solar cell, that's three. So most of the solar cells nowadays are three junction solar cells, and they give you about 30% efficiency, okay? So, so just show you here this multi-junction uh, solar cells, and it just shows you going from silicon again and going to this three five. Look at this increase in the efficiency in three-junction solar cells. You know, it's amazing uh, going from sixteen percent, you know, to about about forty percent. You see, silicon never could do that. You say so. You can see, you know, how you can increase going from two junction. Uh, you see, to three junction. So most of these are three junction uh, the, the, the devices. So you know, by stacking more uh, uh, cells on top of each other, you increase the efficiency of the solar cells. So now, uh, you know, is how can we boost the efficiency of these triple junction solar cells? Most of the solar cells, based on three five semiconductors, are based on gallium, indium, phosphorus. Gallium arsenic and germanium. This multi cell, uh, you know, fully match the, the solar the, the solar spe spectrum. Okay, so these are the three junctions which people are using are using now. So this is practically what's happened. This is the spectrum, you know, given by the sun. This is what you know trying to exploit this uh, using this material system, three different material system to absorb these energies from the sun. And as I said, the current state of the art for three junction solar cells is about 33% and they are in production. You can buy them now from many, many companies, uh, these uh, so, so solar cells, you see, so it's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, you know, the way you stack these solar cells are very, very important. Usually you put, you put the one which is absorbed at high energy on the top and the one which absorb, uh, you know, uh, uh, the one which absorb uh, uh, at low energy at the bottom. This is very, very important the way you stack them. So now, of course, this, as I said, the, is, it, the state of the art is three junction and this 33%. Of course, we would like to, you know, uh, stack more, you see, to uh, absorb some other region in, in this uh, solar spectrum. Of course, we want to put four solar cells, five solar cells, one on top of the other, but it's a very big challenge. You see, to, to you know, to put one material on top of the other, so it's not easy, and I can you know go through that you know uh, later on. So here, for example, we wish to really now, as I said here, as you can see here, we are already expo exploiting some of this region here, of the solar spectrum. So we want probably to exploit this region here, uh, uh, you know, a material which can absorb around this region here. So this is what is represented, for example, by this yellow material system. Okay, so now the, the, the semiconductor I've showed you before usually have an energy bond gap of 1.8 EV. That's in the gallium arsenal. Uh, uh, I just go back to show you here. So this is gallium indium phosphide has about 1.8 EV. Gallium arsenal is about 1.4 EV. And germanium is about 0.7 EV. So you can see these are the, the semiconductors people have been using to absorb this. And now, for example, you can see there is an energy here missing, and that's what we call the one EV new material. So there was a big quest to search for a material system which has got one electron volt uh, bond gap, who can absorb an energy at one electron volt, but should be matched to all this material system because you, you cannot stack different material system on top of the other and wish for the best. There is some criteria uh, when you stack one material system on top of the other, uh, you know, in order to, 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 to avoid a lot of problems. So one of the criteria is how actually, to, to, you know, all these material systems should have the same lattice constant. So this is the size of the crystal. So all these materials, at least they should have the same lattice constant of the crystal. Because if one of them has got a bigger lattice than the other, so you're going to have start having strain. 
And when you got strain, you can have cracks and you got a lot of defects related to strain and that will practically will reduce the efficiency of your solar cells, you say. So it's okay to use metric material to fully match the solar spectrum, but in order, as I said, to boost this uh, efficiency, and it's predicted, for example, if we use this one EV material, we should hopefully go even beyond the 40%. People are predicting even 50% efficiency. But there is some very important uh, criteria I have to follow. So the quest is how can you find one EV material system in order to boost the efficiency of existing uh, triple junction um, uh, so, uh, solar cells? So this was a challenge that was challenged for a long time. Action. So here, just to give you, for example, if you use a two solar a two solar cells, which only uh, use two parts of the solar spectrum, for example, gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, you get about 31%. <coughs> if you use, for example, that's what people have, you know, if you use one EV as well, it should increase to 38%. And if you use this uh, four junction, you should, you know, go beyond 41 percent that means was predicted 50 percent efficiency okay here which material and this is you know we are looking for this one ev material and we want to see which one we're going to choose and this is not easy so this probably this diagram we probably help you understand you know this lattice constant which are aimed so here the aim is to find a material which has got one electron volt bond gap, but which is nearly not as much to gallium arsenide because all these semiconductors here I've showed you, gallium nitrophosphide, gallium arsenide, and germanium have the same, nearly the same lattice constant. So you can put them on top of the other without a problem. So you can see here, for example, here is gallium arsenide, here is gallium phosphide. As you can see, uh, gallium phosphide. So, and here is germanium. So you can see germanium has the same lattice constant gallium arsenide. But if you use gallium arsenide and phosphorus, you can choose a composition in order to give you nearly lattice match to gallium arsenide. So as you can see here, if I look the one EV, it's very very hard. It's very very hard to find a semiconductor in this three five semiconductor to really have. A uh, uh, lattice constant about 5.6 onction is very, very difficult. As you can see, this one here is very, very difficult. However, you know, people have been doing research on different material systems and they just come across something which they didn't expect. Practically, they didn't expect this to happen at all. So, what they will, as you can see here, for example, for this material system, like we got indium arsenide and gallium arsenide. Oh, sorry, let me just use gallium arsenide and aluminium arsenide, this aluminium arsenide and gallium arsenide. I can add to gallium arsenide, I can add aluminium. And by adding aluminium, I do not change the lattice constant, but I do change the energy of the bond gap of this material, aluminium gallium arsenide. So here I can go from gallium arsenide around 1.42 to aluminium arsenide about 2.2 EV without changing you know, the lattice constant. So I can tune to any bond gap I wish from 1.42 to around 2.2 without changing the lattice constant. That's extremely important. However, if you use indium arsenide and gallium arsenide, <coughs> and if you add gallium to indium arsenide, as you can see, as you add more gallium, more gallium, the lattice constant changes from about 6 to about 5.6. So with this material, unfortunately, you cannot keep the lattice constant. You can change the energy of this indium gallium arsenide by changing the, the, the amount of gallium in indium arsenide, but the lattice constant doesn't change. So only there are few materials, for example, gallium antimonide, aluminum antimonide, where you can change the, you know, the composition without affecting the lattice constant, gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, aluminum phosphide, but some other materials, it's very, very difficult. So how we can find one EV material system which practically have nearly the same lattice constant as gallium arsenide, as germanium. And again, as I said, this really happened by mistake. Well, not mistake, just by chance. 
So people were looking actually at gallium arsenide. As you can see, this diagram is a bit different because it's a very uh, wide bond gap. So here, this energy bond gap is going even to six electron volt. So here I'm adding here gallium nitride, and here you've got gallium arsenide. So, you know, gallium arsenide has got about 5.6 uh, elect uh, uh, angstrom uh, lattice constant. Gallium nitride has got about three uh, uh, angstrom. So you see it's a huge difference in lattice constant uh, between this material system. But what people were interested in is, you know, adding nitrogen or changing the composition of gallium arsenide, going from gallium arsenide to gallium nitride by adding more nitrogen. So instead of finding a relationship like this one for indium arsenide and gallium arsenide, which just increases kind of linearly, it didn't go like this. And in fact, actually decreases when you add nitrogen before it starts increasing again. So this is what we call a band bowing. So the band is bowing here and is going up again. So we can see in case in this case, instead of by adding nitrogen to gallium arsenide, instead of increasing its bond, bond gap, actually you decrease its bond gap to a certain amount of nitrogen before it starts increasing again. Okay, and we know the, the, the gallium arsenide is 1.4 EV, and then it means that if you add nitrogen to the gallium arsenide, its bond gap can decrease below 1.4 EV. So that's what people were looking at. So they were, that's what we call the dilute nitride. And I will explain in a bit what it, what it, do, it, do, it does mean. You say, so this is again, we just want to have uh, an alloy made of gallium arsenide and nitrogen. And But unfortunately, well, fortunately, well, unfortunately, that depends how we see it, it, this is behaved in a very different way than the other three, five semiconductor like indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, or gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide, that you can see how this changes. It is very, very important. So here, <clears throat> I'm showing you again, this diagram is the group three, the group five, and you can see the nitrogen is here. And uh, of course, the gallium arsenide is in here. So you can see the nitrogen is a much smaller atom than the arsenic. So what it means when you put gallium arsenide nitrogen, you're replacing arsenic with nitrogen, which is a smaller amount. But of course, you got as well bismuth which is well group five. And that's a very interesting material too, uh, you see. So as well, you can add bismuth to gallium arsenide because it's group three, five. So you can have gallium arsenide with nitrogen. You can have gallium arsenide with bismuth, or you can have gallium arsenide with both nitrogen and bismuth. And these two atoms, as you can see, one is smaller than arsenic, one is bigger than arsenic. And they have, they have a different behavior in the gallium arsenide, which is really, uh, you, you know, something, you know, very unexpected uh, was found when people were looking or investigating wide bond gap semiconductor like gallium nitride, for example, gallium and nitride. Okay, and this is very, very important. So, if you look, at, you know, at this, this material system, uh, this gallium arsenide nitrogen, uh, what we call, you know, what people have found for some small amount of nitrogen, around 5%, you can decrease this bond gap uh, quite a lot. And I will show you some example. So this is very, very important. Here we just, as you can see in this alloy system, because of this bowing thing, I'm going to show you how, the, by adding nitrogen and adding bismuth, how this, you know, when you add nitrogen and bismuth to gallium arsenide, for example, what's happened. So here is what we call them the dilute, three, five semiconductors. So this gallium arsenide with bismuth or gallium arsenide with nitrogen, or actually you can add all those nitrogen and bismuth. And this has been really attracting a lot of, a lot of attention because of their potential properties. They are very, very important properties. And of course, applications. As a solar cell, because we need to reach one electron volt, and as well for optoelectric devices, which emit into infrared because if you reduce the bond gap, that means uh, you, you, you know you reduce the energy, you increase the wavelength. So that means if you want you know infrared uh, lasers, for example, you you these are very important devices actually for infrared lasers, and there are a lot of work uh, you know where people are investigating this uh, this new dilute system uh, for making as well you know infrared lasers 
uh, using gallium arsenide. Because if you want to reach this long wavelength or low energies, you have to use a different material system which are more expensive. So it's a, it has got a very, very intriguing bond structures. This dilute nitride, this bismite, and, nit and nitride have got a very, very uh, intriguing bond structures. So what people have been finding that the bond gap of gallium arsenide can be reduced by about 100, 100 MeV for every percent of nitrogen, or about 90 MeV for every percent of bismuth. So we can see the gallium arsenide has got a bond gap of 1.42 electron volt. So if you need only 4% of nitrogen to reach one electron volt, this one electron volt we are looking for. And the same thing for bismuth. If you add about 94% uh, uh, of bismuth, you can reach about one EV in, 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 in gallium arsenide with bismuth. So this is a very, but of course there are challenges. I will come to this challenge in a bit. So first, let me explain when you add bismuth, we add, uh, we add um, uh, uh, nitrogen, what's happened to the bond gap of gallium arsenide. So this is the bond gap of gallium arsenide. So this is the conduction bond, as you can see here, and this is the valence bond. Forget these other uh, bonds in, in the valence bond. Look mainly at the top one. So as you can see, this is a, a direct bond semiconductor, and this is the bond gap of, of, of gallium arsenide, which is about 1.4 EV. All right. So now when you add nitrogen to gallium arsenide, what's happened? So what's really happened is amazing. You introduce apparently you know, a, a, a nitrogen-related state in the, in the conduction bond of gallium arsenide, and it, this, what, this is the gallium arsenide. What the, this state, it will split this uh, this uh, conduction bond of gallium arsenide in two bonds. So this is what we call E, 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 e minus E plus. So one of these bonds is below the minimum of the conduction bond of gallium arsenide, and the other one is above the conduction bond. But you can see this one now, allow me practically to have a lower energy gap than the gallium arsenide. However, it, this in, uh, the introduction or incorporation of nitrogen in gallium arsenide, it doesn't affect the valence bond at all. However, if you introduce bismuth into gallium arsenide, it's a different story. It seems that the bismuth as well has got, it introduces a state in the in valence bond this time. It's like, it, it behaves like, a, you know, like a whole state. So what it does, it, it does push, practically create a split as well, at the top of the valence bond, uh, you know, and it pushes it up which means now you reduce the bond gap of gallium arsenide without affecting the conduction bond. So you can see in this situation by adding, from, so if you add nitrogen, you, you decrease the, the, the conduction bond, you add bismuth, you increase the, the top of the valence bond, and then you can, by adding, for example, nitrogen and bismuth, you can actually bring both of them and you can tune it to the right values of nitrogen and bismuth to get one electron volt and hopefully you get a lot is much to gallium arsenide because you're not you're not using too much bismuth, you're not using too much nitrogen, so the lattice constant doesn't change too much. So here we are playing by how much we can add nitrogen and how much we add bismuth in order to get tuned to uh, this bond gap to one EV uh, without changing too much the, uh, the, 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 the lattice constant of this uh, uh, compound. See, this is how, how it works. And there are a lot of theory peep, pe papers which predicted this, but now this we can see it experimentally uh, very, very easily, but it's been theoretical. And that's what I really, as I said, there was a big, big a new field, a new material system, this dilute nitride and dilute bismuth. So here, just to give you, for example, you know, a, an example of, of a very old one, actually, some people tried this a, a long time ago, uh, you know, uh, with, with nitrogen. So this is actually just using nitrogen, just to give you an example of these four junction solar cells, you say. <clears throat> As you can see here, even those days, there was still some problems because of the quality of the material. So the efficiency wasn't, you know, that very, very much great because it was still some problem. But, but people were working on this for a long time. But there was still a lot of challenges because when you introduce nitrogen, 
obvious, but you introduce a lot of defects. And as well, how can you get rid of this defect which affect the efficiency of the solar cells? But I can say to you now that you can, you know, I, because of the time constraint, I couldn't go through many of those uh, slides. So now actually you can buy these this, uh, four junction solar cells from some companies bought in, in Europe, which have got about 40 to 43 percent efficiency, and they are based, for example, on the four junction solar cells. Which have got, which which are based, of course, on the three junction plus the one EV uh, 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 junction. Uh, you see, and this now we can buy them commercially uh, for, from from uh, from company. So the, all these actually uh, materials are practically grown by molecular emipitaxis. Just actually this uh, cross section showing you the different layers of these solar cells. As you can see here, uh, in this case. <clears throat> There are different material systems, as you can see here. It's a very, very complicated actually device, and I originally explained the basic of it. Yeah. And all these are grown by this technique is called molecular beam epitaxy, uh, which is practically uh, you know um, a simple technique of evaporation. So we used to have one actually in Nottingham, this is a research machine, but now they are all production machine, which can really produce the solar cells based on this uh, four junction solar cell on one EV material system, which is very, very, very important. So these are much, much bigger uh, uh, machines because they are meant for production uh, machines. Uh, I've got a video actually which explain some of these, um, uh, the, the, uh, some of these uh, principles by growing this molecular beam epitaxy solar cells uh, in some of my websites, which I can send to you. Uh, but just here, just to show you from the first slide was showed you before, about you know the you know that uh, periodic table, you know uh, solar cells are not no a laboratory curiosity. This you know uh, you, you know the photovoltaic effect has been discovered many 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 years you know by Einstein and so on with uh, very very important theories about photovoltaics. But of course, as I said, it was a, 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 it took a long long time actually to really uh, make these solar cells. As you can see, the first few. Example was in, in, in early 60s, uh, and it was very, very small. They were very, very crude. So these solar cells they are not anymore laboratory cells. They are already a multi-billion dollar industry, as you all know. Not only, of course, for, for the space uh, application, but of course, as well, for terrestrial applications. You know, but we don't use usually the 3.5 because they are, of course, more expensive and you don't need uh, you don't need uh, those kind of solar cells on top of your uh, thing to go to expensive. So the efficiency improvements in photovoltaics are still ongoing, but believe me, you know every percent efficiency, uh, every improvement in efficiency, for example, half percent, one percent, is a very big struggle. As you've seen in one of the diagram, I showed you the silicon over 60 years, it only increased from 20 from 12 percent to around 20 percent you know, only about 8% efficiency. How do we think, you know, with silicon, you would be able to do that very easily? But of course, there are some challenges, uh, you know, for silicon. So you see every percent you've seen in papers published today, and they show improvement to 1%, that one half percent, 1% is really a big saga. You see, but uh, but for some reason, you know, for the for the three five silicon, by stacking this 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 uh, solar cell three, two, one junction, two, three, and four junction, you've seen this increase amazing, going from like twenty percent to forty percent in a very very short time. You know, it's amazing, and this is still in, in improving all the time. And I would say this molecular beam epitaxy technique has been playing a really important role in making this uh, material system. Uh, you know, for this next generation of photovoltaics and as well for infrared um, uh, optoelectronics like lasers and so on. So there is a plenty, but still some challenges, for example, with the bismuth, uh, you know, material based material, the dilute bismuth material, because still some defect. And of course, you, you know, uh, it's uh, one important thing as well, you know, it's very, very hard to incorporate actually these atoms like nitrogen and bismuth into the gallium arsenic, you have to play some special tricks to apply. Because remember, you are replacing arsenic with a smaller atom like nitrogen or bigger atom like bismuth, and then there are a lot of big challenges to grow this material system as well. 
So I hope here today I've just given you an overview of this field of dilute nitrite, dilute bismite, which can be used for solar cells and they are used for solar cells, at least with the nitrogen NOAA that is are commercially available. Uh, so I'm very, very happy to uh, ask uh, to answer any question you might have and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, uh, for your nice talk and uh, in detail technical discussions about the solar cells, including the advantages of the 3-5 uh, uh, materials, uh, not only the 3-5 materials, but also the dilute nitride materials and its applications for the space, um, uh, space energy generation. So this session is now open for the questions. So anybody, if you want to ask some question to uh, Professor Henini, you can ask it now. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, Professor Henini, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I am interested. Is it possible to uh, combine uh, these inorganic um, crystals and fossils with uh, some maybe organic uh, disordered materials? So it is uh, very will not uh, boost the efficiency of this tandem. Or this, I'm not head of junction, I would say. So, so, so Alex, do, do you mean, you know, uh, combining organic and non-organic? Yes, yes. You, you talked about uh, 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 lattice, lattice size and uh, energy and uh, how to improve it uh, uh, only within this uh, inorganic uh, crystals. But if we combine uh, some maybe um, organic crystal, would say, or, or hybrid uh, Hybrid, but you like perovskite and uh, yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So, 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 so you, you know, uh, one of the big challenges, for example, for all organic materials, is how uh, is their stability. The, yeah. You see, uh, it's very, 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 very important. Remember, you, you see, uh, 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 one of, we can of course, you know, grow organic or non-organic uh, semiconductors. We've done this in Nottingham. Of course, but the problem is yeah, they are not as stable as, for example, the three five because it's a solid story. You, you say so. The organic, the problem with the organic, even now as a single cell, whether the perovskites or any organic, you have to encapsulate them. You have to be careful with the moisture. You have to humidity. All this will affect them. You say, and this, for example, this kind of solar cells. Although you know, you show now uh, people have shown that it is a very big increase in the efficiency in the perovskite, for example. But the problem is the stability and the lifetime. And yeah. how actually, uh, how they can as well, because remember this uh, three, five semiconductor when they're in space, one of the big challenges here is radiation. You got radiation in space, you got, you got heat in space. So these are very radiation resistant. So that's why, for example, even silicon is not good in space because of the radiation, because when a silicon is, is the radiation, say for example, gamma rays for in space, it does affect uh, the, sil the silicon properties enormously. So this is why the 3.5, especially the high bond gap semiconductors, they are more uh, uh, radiation uh, resistant than the lower bond, bond gap semiconductors. Uh, you see, and they are really use a very, very hard uh, environment. So, I think the perovskites and those kind of materials, they might have some niches, you say, in, 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 in commercially. But I think it's going to be very, very hard to reach those uh, efficiencies of 46% in 3.5 and being as well resistant to radiation, heat, moisture. I mean, those solar cells, you can leave them outside for days for, under the rain, whatever. And the, but I think, you know, the organic, this is the problem. And of yeah. course, as well, uh, the organic usually, you can actually evaporate the organic as well. But of course, because they are usually mainly low temperature, you see, you have to grow them at very low, because they can decompose very, very quickly. So usually they are less than 200 degrees Celsius grown in, in you know, in, in vacuum, you see. But as well, what is very important, Alex, is that all these materials are grown in this molecular beam metaxy in a very high vacuum. So the purity, yes. The purity of these materials is amazing. So you, you see, it's uh, that's what is very, you know, compared to the organic, you see, and very reproducible to make. You can make the same solar cell today 
tomorrow, and so on. Uh, you, you know, uh, chemically, all the time, there are some challenges. Uh, you, you see, to reproduce the same de devices. Uh, you see, so there are some niches in, uh, for, for example, for the organic, but I think it's going to be very, very difficult to compete, even for the we compete with silicon, for example, to put them in on top of your roof, whatever. You say because of the size and so on, but the three five, I think, are the, the the horse. I think if the cost of the three five decreases, okay, I think those will be used territorially. You know, on Earth you can use them. You know, and you will use a fraction instead of using a panel of ten meters, probably use a panel of one meter using three five semiconductor for the same efficiency. Uh, you say uh, so. So so this is a challenge for the organic, uh, Alexei. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The next sessions uh, will be carried over by the Professor Rupal Dash. So I'll just introduce about him. So Professor Dash is a professor of Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Kanpur, and his field of specializations is optoelectronics, semiconductor device, and lasers, mill millimetric, and microwave circuits. So <clears throat> his research area is the multi-quantum well intermixed waveguide. Uh, grating assisted and high speed waveguide photodiodes, silicon germanium carbide and silicon carbide quantum dashed LED on silicon by spinon technique and laser assisted visions through fog. So, uh, so his academic uh, degree is, pro is BSc physics in 1976 from University of Calcutta. And he is BTEC from the Radio Physics and Electronics from University of Calcutta, and MTEC from Radio Physics and Electronics University of Calcutta. And he has done his MSc from uh, in Electrical Engineering uh, from Rizon State University, and PhD in Electrical Engineering in Solid State Physics in Solid State in University of Michigan. So he has. Uh, many awards and fellowship, fellow of IEE, ITPLE senior member, and eminent engineers of Tau Beta P and Aparna Charang Ganguly Prize for highest scores in mathematics in pre university 1972, Calcutta University, and four papers cited in volume 24 of monograph series on semiconductors and semi-metals on stained quantum oil semiconductor first work on integrated optical device on these uh, materials. So he has many research publications, around uh, 50 plus publications he has in good reputed journals. So uh, with the short introductions, I will invite to Professor Dash to uh, start his technical session, sir. Okay, I was uh, nice. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, well, I superannuated from my job at IIT Kanpur, but I still exist here as an emeritus fellow. And uh, the work that I'm going to present today are essentially one of my PhD students' work uh, with two other MTech students assisting him. Now, I was happy to learn that in the previous talk, uh, Professor uh, was uh, championing compound semiconductors. And I have that faith in compound semiconductors too, because although it's expensive, in performance wise, in all respects, it's much better. Now, the today's topic is integrated 3D spot size transformer using indium gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, quantum well intermix, tapered waveguides. And as you can see, indium gallium arsenide or indium phosphide belongs to the compound semiconductor group. So I'm going to talk about this today. And let's go to the second slide. And uh, going by the topic of this webinar, I picked up uh, three key words, sustainability, advanced, and hybrid materials. First, let's talk about sustainability. Now, during the COVID period in India as well as elsewhere, we have seen that, uh, especially in India, that pollution levels had come down because most of the people were working from home. 
so less paperwork everything was electronic less travel so pollution went down and if we use less paper obviously we are going towards sustainability of earth because we are uh, using less resources and petroleum products were also less used and therefore pollution came down so this is where it goes into sustainability what is advanced more advanced than whatever already exists so we have to do better how do we do better now if you understand what has been happening uh, these days is that a lot of people had been disenfranchised from their learning process or teaching process because their accessibility to this high speed network was limited so where do we need to go we have 10 gigabits per second communication going on in india and elsewhere also around around the world although some areas in niche areas some 40 gigabits per second optical communication still goes on now that is where uh, the bottleneck lies and uh, if we could upgrade it to 100 gbps gigabits per second optical communications we would be doing far better so that is where we are trying to go by using advanced techniques and then comes hybrid materials which is part of this topic also so we have to design materials that do not exist in nature now compound semiconductors do exist in nature but uh, trying to engineer these materials for our own good or to achieve the first two steps the, the topics that i have spoken about is uh, what why hybrid materials have to come into the picture so these are engineered materials why tapered wave guides why do we need them high power laser diodes can be quite easily made but to make them live for a long period of time one needs to do an engineering of the facets because the facets also behave as mirrors although you may dep be depositing anti reflection coatings or partial reflection coatings to to boost your reflectivities but the uh, interface between this dielectric and the semiconductor still remains and there could be defects and therefore due to facet damage most of the times these uh, power diode uh, lasers fail now what can be done if the intensity at the facet could be reduced then one would have a longer living power diode laser now how do we do that we'll come to the next slide then we have high speed photo detectors say greater than 100 gbps or 100 gbps and these wave guides are usually of the wave guide uh, wave guide type but the thickness of the eye region where the photons are going to be absorbed has to be very thin because the electron hole pairs that are created has to be very quickly uh, uh, collected by the two electrons and therefore this region is very thin then coupling power to this narrow thickness becomes a problem it becomes inefficient and therefore the sensitivity of these detectors becomes very low so for both of these cases we need a large cross section at the facet or the fiber end facet for the high power diode lasers and fiber end for the photo detectors wave guide photo detectors so how do we do that next section next slide we will look into it on the left hand top corner there is this diagram of the mode that is traveling inside the high power laser and the intensity is supposed to be very high at the peak now if we could expand the mode in such a way as it goes left towards the facet you can see that the intensity the area under the curve remains the same because the number of photons are same therefore uh, the peak has to drop down as you can see on the leftmost curve blue curve so this is the principle on which uh, these high power laser diodes should be built on the other hand if we look at the right hand picture of a photo detector high speed photo detector the uh, big blue circle is what the fiber mode at the output of the fiber looks like when it hits the semiconductor and the fiber is encoupled to this wave right and the i active layer is where the photons are going to be detected 
So if you look at the overlap, it is very poor in terms of coupling efficiency into this particular layer. So one needs to improve that to have a reasonable high speed photo detector. Now, if we go, how do we achieve that? Let's go to the diagram at the bottom. And you can see we have a bunch of quantum wells shown by these blue and deep blue horizontal lines. So on the right hand side is your active medium, whether it's a, a, a powered laser diode or the, uh, the high speed photo detector. And towards the facet, what we do is we change the, the, the refractive index in such a way that the mode is smeared out. So how do we achieve that? Here is a picture which shows zinc zirconia is deposited on top of this layer. And all we need to do is anneal it. And it does it by itself. We need to look at this in more detail in the later slides. But this is the idea behind what we are doing here. So making a waveguide taper has been a subject of research since uh, 1986, I guess, when I was a student. Uh, I was finishing up my PhD and that uh, when it's all started, optical integration on semiconductors. And uh, more, the more recent work, you can see that 2018, it has been done by, uh, by shadow masking, which is difficult to do, very difficult to do. Selective area regrowth, 2019, another published paper. And, but selective area regrowth has been on since uh, 1986 or earlier, even earlier. So those techniques to make uh, waveguide tapers had been there already. Recently, last year, you can see another paper which is on the same topic as that of 2018. They have made tapered waveguides using line width controlled local optical dose variation. So it's by doing tricks in masking and exposing through photoresist that they are doing. But how are we going to do it? Is it any simpler? In the next slide, you will see what it should look like. So if you look at the left-hand top uh, schematic, you can see on the top, there is a narrow waveguide, which is whose inner core or the active region is even narrower. And on the left-hand side, the waveguide is much wider, although the thickness remains same. So this is what we would call a horizontal taper. So that uh, the mode size is laterally much larger compared to the other end by just doing photolithography and edge. So we change the waveguide mode in such a way or the waveguide geometries in such a way that the mode size increases. So in between, if we have to couple this mode into the tight mode of the waveguide, we need an adiabatic taper. What is an adiabatic taper? It is a taper where there is minimum loss due to scattering and reflection due to changes in the waveguide dimensions. Now, the selective area regrowth and the shadow masking and all that takes care of the vertical tapering also. So the mode can laterally be increased by increasing the width of the waveguide, provided we decrease the refractive index under this wide waveguide to smaller values compared to the other end. Because if we just widen uh, this width of the waveguide, as in section three, you would see that uh, multimodes will start appearing unless you lower the refractive index. So we don't want that. We want single mode all through so that there is good coupling between the big mode to the small mode. Both are sync should be single mode. So in between, we have this region two, which is the adiabatic taper. And if you look at the diagram shown in blue, is the mode size drawn vertically. So the mode size, if you look at uh, the, the, the active uh, uh, device end, is much narrower compared to that at the input end. So how does one achieve that? So the way we are doing it is by 
uh, intermixing these quantum waves that we have put in the structure such that uh, the refractive index which was decided by the quantum well energies the lowest energies of the conduction band and the valence band are now smeared out so that they form indium gallium arsenide phosphide gaussian wells or just bulk to the extreme they would be bulk and the refractive index because the band gap would be larger the refractive index would be smaller so we have vertically also because of the decrease in the refractive index we are not compacting the wave optical wave in a small region vertically also we are spreading it out so this is the way that you can couple the large mode of the fiber optical fiber into this device on the right hand side you can see the picture of this fabricated wave guide where you have this 10 micron wide rib wave guide which is single mode and there is an intermediate region which is the taper this goes from about 16 micrometer to about 30 micrometer long wave guide you can make it longer even that will eat up your footprint on your expensive semiconductor substrate and 16 micron we found out was the limit uh, after beyond which below which uh, you will have serious uh, losses so 16 to 30 micron is workable and if you have more money you make it longer to have the least loss in inside the taper so how does we get this vertical taper horizontal taper as you can see can easily be done by photolithography and reactive ion etching next slide so this is the structure peculiar structure that we have to choose to do all this essentially it's a pin structure but there are uh, since uh, we want a high speed uh, device uh, we have to do we cannot do p plus i n plus we have to bring the collectors closer but we cannot bring it very close because they will contribute to carriers in the i region or the intrinsic region so we have to dope it a little lower so there are two p regions before it comes to the i region the i region as you can see on the top picture consists of 52 uh, quantum wells or 52 periods and on the other end there are 26 periods of the same structure these are basically cladding layers that come in to the wave guide the wave guide is a graded index structure which has a single quantum well sitting in the middle now how do we achieve the graded uh, index structure we do not have continuous variation of the composition of the indium gallium arsenide phosphide structure which others do we found out a simpler method by which we change the size of the quantum wells so that its quantized energy is such that it gives a varying band gap so this varying band gap then contributes to varying refractive index so we have a graded index profile uh, this has several consequences that the divergent beam is uh, narrower and this helps in coupling power into the wave guide uh, on the other hand uh, it's it's is tightly bound inside the core region and single quantum well could be your uh, laser active single quantum well or it could be the absorption layer for the photo detector either way so the next plan is now to at at the broader mode end to intermix these quantum wells so that the refractive index is not decided by the quantum well energies anymore rather they are decided by broad gaussian type quantum wells or or basically bulk material we we'll go to the next slide to look at this there is some somebody has unmuted their now professor prada pesa professor kumar uh, please uh, mute your mic okay so if you can see in this picture we have the schematic of this 
uh, I multi quantum well region and the two cladding regions. And we take this semiconductor uh, wafer and then coat it with zirconia, which has a tapered thickness uh, on one end where we want to disorder the whole thing. We have thin zirconia and wherever we don't want to disturb the quantum wells, we have a thick zirconia. And the thickness in between varies in the tapered waveguide region. So if you look at the schematic in the middle diagram, you can see the red shows the largest band gap and the yellow shows the original band gap. And in between there is a variation of band gap. So if there is a variation of band gap, then uh, one, can, uh, one can have variation in refractive index. Larger the band gap, lower the refractive index. This is usually how it works in C5 compound semiconductors. Now, others have done a similar thing, but uh, they have not done it with a taper. They have made two different waveguides, one waveguide which is of larger band gap and the other waveguide which is the active material, active device, and then the wave couples from one waveguide to the other. This was done at Sandia Labs, and uh, I've seen their results, I have reviewed their paper, uh, but there is one step necessary, that is uh, actually two. We have to have a buffer layer on top, which is the protective layer, then the implant phosphorus, and after in intermixing due to this phosphorus implant, they have to remove the defects created by the implantation, which is the top layer has to be removed. So they put a sacrificial layer on top and then implant it with phosphorus and then remove the defect uh, defects, the layer full of defects on the top, etch it off with a preferential etch. Now it involves two extra steps. So we thought of a new technique where we are using zirconia and the phosphorus diffuses into the zirconia up to a certain depth. Due to the creation of these vacancies now, which are defects, they percolate into the multi-quantum well. And then there, the, these assist in exchange of species, is essentially the group five species between the quantum wells. I'll show you later in the next slide. Now, the photolithography to be done has to be aligned with the taper region of this zirconia, because that is where your waveguide tapering is taking place vertically. So the horizontal taper should also be there, exactly aligned on top of that. And that is shown in the bottom diagram. Now we look at the uh, uh, quantum well intermixing in a little bit more detail. In the next slide, as you can see, so we have indium phosphide, and indium gallium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide phosphide. Now, if there is phosphorus vacancy, the group three exchange doesn't take place much. So the band gap as seen in the quantum well on the red curve decreases if you do it with fluorine. We have seen this already. But if you do it with this zirconia cap, which is impurity free, then uh, the group three is sort of tapers off, but the group five, which is the phosphorus, phosphorus arsenic exchange, becomes more dominant. And if you have phosphorus coming in from the indium phosphide into the indium gallium arsenide, it will form a larger band gap material of indium gallium arsenide phosphide, whereas the barrier decreases a little bit from indium phosphide to indium gallium arsenide phosphide. This is what happens. And this work was published uh, in one of our earlier work, which is uh, given below. And let's look at the curve with uh, black uh, uh, triangles, which is uh, after capping of zirconia, it has to be annealed at a high temperature for a very short while. So we have done it at 700 degrees C for 40 seconds and 750 degree for 40 seconds. So between the two cases, obviously, if you do it at high temperature, you get a much larger blue shift in the band gap. But on the other hand, if, if that may deteriorate things elsewhere in the uh, 
in the in the compound semiconductor layer because uh, that is phosphorus is very sensitive to this temperature so we are doing this work at 700 degrees c for 40 seconds and if you look at the the triangles you can see that as we change the zirconia cap thickness we see a maximum blue shift at around 400 nanometers thick zirconia and at the rightmost end you see uh, for 600 nanometer thick zirconia the blue shift has become minimal it, it's not there that blue shift is zero mind you blue shift is minimal so we cannot escape uh, having a blue shift in the active region so the device has to be designed in such a fashion that it can accept some blue shift uh, but on the other hand if you look at this much of change which is about say 10 10 milli electron volts change in the band gap that should be good enough for our device and this is where we need to concentrate which is encircled by an oblong on the right hand side bottom of the diagram the three three triangles that are encircled so that is of interest now we go to the next slide uh but before we come to this let me just give you okay so let's say the 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 uh, quantum wells are disordered maximum where we have 400 nanometer thickness of zirconia and minimum which is negligible at 600 nanometer thick zirconia site so if we now calculate the interdiffusion by uh, the models that we have all de uh, developed in our laboratory we can calculate the refractive index of each of these layers and for each cross section then we can calculate the effective index and uh, the mode of calculating these refractive index for the quantum wells was done by uh one of my earlier phd students tathagat bomik and we have a patent on it and that patent also uh, patent cannot be take, uh, taken for a software you can only take a copyright so we had uh, attached a uh, rapid thermal annealing system with it and if you tell this software which band gap you want what is your starting band gap and which band gap you want it will calculate the energies that you require and then it will calculate the temperature and time that this rapid thermal annealing system uh, should be used for and it can automatically control that rapid thermal annealing system so this for this we have a patent so now if we have these uh, these refractive indices and the effective index of these particular layers then we can introduce in a commercial software called lumeric which we had purchased and uh, giving it inputs it can it can uh, see first with the first software you see, you see the plot on the left hand side so you can compute the refractive indices as a function of the quantum well thicknesses and if you remember in the earlier slide we talked about we have a bunch of these quantum wells uh, either for the cladding layer or for the 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 graded index structure and for each quantum well size we have calculated the uh, the refractive index when it is unaltered which is the black curve and when it is altered which is the red curve so you can see the refractive index definitely has come down so now we use this into lumeric and we find the right hand curve where the mode size increases so this is plotted against the indium gallium arsenide core thickness in micrometers and all you can see is that when the mode size goes on increasing as the indium gallium arsenide core increases so the mode confinement also increases with the indium gallium arsenide thickness so if we reduce the indium gallium arsenide thickness by intermixing then we in, uh, we 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 less confine the mode and the mode uh, 
uh, field diameter goes on increasing, as you can see in the solid curves. Now, if you go to the next slide, these are uh, results of the simulation. The top two are the refractive indices given to the software, Lumeric. On the left-hand side figures, A, figure A, C and E, uh, A and C would be for the broad end where you have the photolithographically etched 10 micron wide rib wave, right? Or 12 micron wide rib wave, right? And on the right hand side, you have the output end, which is the 4 micron wide rib wave, right? And if you see the uh, figures A and B, you will see that the refractive index in the core active region is red, which is the maximum on the right hand picture, which is figure B. Whereas where we have done vertical uh, intermixing, you can see that the refractive index has come down. It is blue, which is much smaller than the red. Now, if we now calculate using numeric the mode sizes or the modal picture, you can see in C, it is the effective index is 3.2, whereas towards the other end, which is the narrower rib width end, you will find that the effective index of this wavelength is 3.29. And therefore, the mode is more confined there, and the mode is much broader on the photo, uh, input side, which is the photo, uh, 10 micron rib wavelength side. Sorry, I made a mistake. D is for the taper region somewhere in the middle. And uh, E is shows you the, the, the mode size at the 4 micron rib wavelength at the other end. So the, the mode size goes from at the input end, which is C, to the output end, which is E. And you can see that the mode size has become really small at the output end, where it uh, connects to the photo detector, high speed photo detector. And F is a top view picture of the same mode, and you can see the same thing that uh, the, the mode is much larger um, at the input end, whereas it's much smaller at the photo detector end. In the next slide, we will see how if we are connecting a fiber, how it interacts with the with the uh, this this tapered waveguide or mode transform transformer waveguide. So we have done this calculation for different rib heights, but uh, the experiment was done on a rib height of 0.6 microns. So it's between uh, the green line and the blue line somewhere of this plot. So the mode size, as you can see, can go up to some few microns. Mode size is the diameter of the mode, basically. And remember, the single mode fibers that we are using have a core which is a mode size of single mode, which is about nine microns. Mode size uh, definition is one over E squared in terms of intensity, one over minus E squared. So one over E minus E squared. As, uh, as your mode intensity, because it's a Gaussian. So one over E squared is how it comes down. And uh, sigma is where it gives us the mode size. So that is nine microns for the single mode fiber. On the other hand, you have tapered uh, optical fibers, which has a spot size of four microns. That is available commercially. So now if we look at the inset, which is the coupling loss, we have the top curve, which is the blue curve, which shows you the overlap from the, this is calculated from the overlap integral of the calculated modes uh, of the waveguide, of the thick waveguide, uh, with respect to the mode size of the optical fiber. And you can see that uh, it starts coming down because if we are connecting the fiber, if we are calculating the overlap integral, obviously when the two becomes mismatched, it the value would come down. 
but uh, real life says that once you have coupled power into the waveguide even if the waveguide see the waveguide width is plotted in the uh, along the x axis so if even if you have larger rib width as long as it is single mode uh, the the efficiency of coupling does not go down it should remain steady at the peak so you see the dotted lines or the dashed lines is the fiber to the waveguide so it reaches a maximum of minus 2 db loss whereas if you take uh, this is for the 4 micron uh, spot size uh, tapered fiber for the 9 micron fiber of oh, sorry let me go back for the 4 micron fiber you can see the peak is happening for a rib waveguide with the 4 micron so the spot size matches the horizontal width of the waveguide for uh, the single mode fiber their single mode fiber connected directly to this waveguide obviously the coupling losses are should be much higher as you as i had shown you in the second uh, slide but uh, if you increase this rib waveguide width around 9 micron 9 to 10 micron within that region you can see that it reaches a maximum of minus 3.5 db loss approximately minus 3.4 kind of db loss and then it remains it should remain constant so this is the loss that we would in, incur if we would have connected a bare fiber to this uh, vertically and horizontally tapered rib wave fiber next slide same pictures expanded views so uh, the active waveguide is the smallest and at the bottom in c you can see the dual tapered waveguide mode so the fiber mode has to overlap with this dual tapered waveguide mode which is that of figure c so i'll not speak much on this so we'll go to the next slide and this is how we fabricate these devices so we put the substrate into a evacuation chamber which has an electron beam source and if we have, we, uh, we are depositing zirconia which is used as the target and the zirconia evaporates and gets deposited onto our compound semiconductor wafer that we have now how do we make the taper that is the bigger question so we have this gadget which was made from a very cheap piezoelectric drive you can get uh, xyz movers which are piezoelectric which will work in vacuum they cost about $5000 and we made this from a uh, piezoelectric that is used in synthesizers from uh, a discarded synthesizer we picked it up and this cost us about uh, what a dollar or two maybe so let's see if it works uh, so you have this piezoelectric flange which is shown in 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 yellow and you have two electrodes which is shown in orange and we apply a bias from outside which you can see the connector on top of this vacuum chamber power supply for the piezo crystal drive and we as we apply power uh, or voltage to this piezoelectric drive it bends and once it bends it moves this 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 uh, this uh, finger that is uh, connected on top horizontally and now how do we calibrate it we shine a laser onto this uh, piezoelectric uh, uh, electrode which is reflecting and by applying a voltage we can see the movement of the laser spot from that we calibrate the horizontal movement of the arm that you see so this arm acts as a shadow to the evaporated zirconia that is coming into the substrate and uh, we can then move the arm and that would cover parts of this waveguide so that uh, not the zirconia is not deposited throughout so for a limited time it is in one place then at another time and another time and so on so forth so the one that gets maximum exposed would have 600 nanometers of zirconia the one that is least exposed 
will have 400 nanometers of zirconia. And in between, there is a variation of this thickness from 400 to 600 nanometers of zirconia. As you can see in the bottom diagram, uh, this is the variation of the thickness shown in yellow. An actual physically the microscopic picture is shown on the left hand bottom, which are these uh, fringe, fringe lines, which is because of this uh, interference seen through white light, which is your tapered region. So we have 400 nanometers zirconia on one side, 600 nanometers zirconia on the other, and in between there is this linear taper. Now this linear taper region has to match the photolithographically done horizontal tapering too, which is in the middle diagram as you can see. So in the middle diagram, the photolithography shows from a wider uh, waveguide on the top to a narrower waveguide on the bottom, and in between there is a taper region. And this taper region is marked by two markers, you can see one at the top and at the bottom. And we do this shading of this tapering of this zirconia in between that region. So when we place the, the substrate on the jig, we do it in such a way that is zero position is at one mark, marker, and then it moves to the other marker till we apply the maximum voltage that we would require. And this is how we get the taper. So now we go to the next, uh, see this I have explained already. So wherever you have 400 nanometers, you will have uh, more intermixing, which is shown by these larger density of dots. When you go to 600 nanometers thickness of zirconia, there are less frequent these uh, white bubbles and therefore you have less intermixing and minimal intermixing pressure. So that is how we uh, obtain the uh, vertical table. So how do we do the measurement now? We take this taper and we, from the uh, wide end, we couple it uh, a laser output through the fiber. Mind you, uh, we were working on this uh, because we were trying to connect power into a photodetector. And this photodetector would work at uh, 1550 nanometers. So the, we had to take a tunable laser where this would be transmitted. Otherwise, uh, it would be absorbed in the layer. So the, from the tuned laser, it goes through the bare uh, fiber. Bare fiber is butt coupled to this uh, wider rib width waveguide, which is vertically also made wide. And then it goes through the taper, and then it goes out to the other end, which is the four micron width rib waveguide, which is the same as that of the photodetector. So for measurement, we broke off the photodetector and did this measurement for losses, for insertion loss, coupling loss, and all this. And below is the picture where this is done. You have two lenses. You can use fibers instead of these. Is one of the right-hand lens, a fiber was used. And the output is picked up by a, 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 a lens and then focused onto a detector to measure the power. So we know the input power. If we know the output power, we can find out the total loss. In that, there are three losses involved. One is the coupling loss. The other is the taper loss. And the third is the propagation loss in these three waveguides. The broad waveguide, the taper, and the narrow waveguide. So if you look at these insertion, measured insertion losses, if we have dual taper, we see that the insertion loss is very small. And uh, after uh, below 1550 nanometers, obviously it starts absorbing so that the losses starts going up. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, the vertically tapered only, it is somewhat better. And the horizontally and vertically tapered, it's much smaller, it's, it's much worse. So dual taper is the red curve where you have vertically and horizontally tapered. Blue curve is the only vertically tapered. And the non-tapered is the black one, which has the maximum losses. On the right hand, you have a picture of that where we are looking at the broad waveguide end. 
and uh, which is defocused at the other end is the narrow waveguide end and you can clearly see the taper in between which goes from a length of say 16 micron to 30 micron. Now if we measure propagation losses in these waveguides, one which is a waveguide of 10 micron wide all through, there's no taper, nothing. So we launch power at one end and we see what is coming out. We find out the coupling losses and from that we can calculate the propagation loss in these waveguides. And if you look at the propagation loss, it is quite large per centimeter, 14 dB to 17 dB with rib width. So for four microns, the losses are much higher because the mode size spreads underneath the rib more and more. And sees, it sees a lot of the interface and therefore uh, losses are much higher in four micron with rib waveguides compared to 10, 12 micron rib waveguides. Because whenever you re do reactive ion etching, there are some defects on the surface and these act as scattering centers and therefore their propagation losses increase. If you had a chemically etched um, waveguide where you would not have vertical walls but slanted walls, your uh, propagation losses are much lower. But uh, these dimensions are difficult to achieve with chemical etching. So one has to do uh, reactive ion etching. Uh, but if you consider the, the lengths of these waveguides, I'll give you one example. The total length of the whole measured device is 1.5 to 1.3 nm millimeters. So immediately the losses become one tenth of this. Uh, if you look at the actual device, which is the taper, which is about 30 micron in length, you can easily compare what would be the propagation loss in that device, very small. So one needs to look at that. And if you look at the bottom table, you can see that uh, the insertion loss and coupling loss has been separated out by measuring the propagation loss. So the maximum insertion loss uh, or the best insertion loss that we would have is minus 7.75 dB and uh, the coupling loss of 3.45 dB is the minimum. Is that good or bad? That's good. <laughs> My, that's surprising to say that's good. Uh, because if you compare uh, with other, unless you uh, couple the fiber to some um, some refractive index matching layer, you will not have a better value. See, if you look at the refractive index of the fiber, that is say 1.5, 1.5 to 1.7, something like that. And the refractive index of the semiconductor waveguide is about 3.5. So there is a large reflection anyway. So you can compare the reflection and see there is a 3 dB loss straight away. So that can be taken care of. This can be reduced by putting uh, coatings on the input facet. Now we go to the insertion loss change. If we look at a non-tapered waveguide of 4 micron width, we see it is very high, somewhere around 16.5, uh, 16.25 dB. If we do only vertical taper for a 4 micron width waveguide, we have about 11 or 10.5 dB. If we do dual taper, we see about, uh, for a 4 micron rib waveguide, we see about, uh, say, 8 dB. So that's the least for a 4 micron rib waveguide, just using a vertical taper by intermixing. Now, if we make the horizontal taper by photolithography and we go to a width of it, you can see that it is, it is so designed so that it matches with the mode size of the uh, bare single mode fiber, that around nine micron waveguide width, nine to 10 micron, it comes down to the minimum, which is seven point or eight, seven point seven five dB uh, insertion loss, which is quite low, I would say, because if you take three dB or 3.2 dB out because of reflection, you're much better off. Now we go to the next slide which is the last one really. And here uh, I'm showing you 
which is not a part of the topic of this lecture but where we are going to in future so on the right hand top picture you can see the input waveguide which is broad waveguide then a tapered waveguide region coming to, to a 4 micron rib waveguide which on which you have a metal contact which is the photodiode region and these photodiodes and these two other uh, blocks that you have rectangular box are basically contact pads with the n plus region so the p plus contact is the small one on top of the waveguide photodiode and the two rectangular blocks are the metal contacts to the n plus region so these three will form your uh, photodiode electrodes the two grounds which is the n plus connect connector and the central electrode which is the top of the p plus of the photo detector and you can see at the bottom left is the actual fabricated device so you have the broad waveguide on the right hand side and on the rightmost there is a single mode optical fiber coming in with a femtosecond laser this was done at isc bangalore this measurement is coming on with a femtosecond laser couples optical power into the broad waveguide then you have a tapered region then you have the photodiode and then the photodiode over an insulator is connected to a coplanar waveguide i am sorry the picture is not large enough to define all these so the three electrodes that you see on the left hand side the two outermost ones are the ground electrode which is connected to the n plus and the central electrode is connected to the p plus on top of the photo detector and uh, then you see a probe which is in the middle with uh, device a probe is connected which has a limit of 20 gigahertz so we could measure our device which works up to 20 gigahertz or 40 giga gigabits per second for this photo detector and uh, we have already measured this, uh, responsivities for these but i am not presenting it here because that would be part of another lecture in future so uh, so we are trying to measure this at another place so that because it is de designed for 50 gigabits per 100 gigabits per second so but they, at isc they have run out of the limit to, to their to their equipment so electronics is what is limiting it and at our place the femtosecond laser has gone down so we are stuck with our measurement so hopefully we will get this done in about a week or two weeks and i'll be able to report a better uh, result so this is the effect of doing so much work on the taper finally in conclusion next slide the monolithic integration of adiabatically coupled fiber matched passive and active waveguide is demonstrated using zirconia impurity free quantum well intermixing adiabatic mode condition of the substantially circular mode in the passive waveguide to the elliptical mode in the active waveguide is implemented through a 30 micron long compact mode transformer using horizontal and vertical tapering vertically and horizontally tapered waveguide reduces the insertion loss by 7.5 dB from the original one thank you for your attention and i am ready to answer a few questions i also have uh, along with this the way of calculating uh, a few slides on way of calculating the refractive indices of quantum wells if you are interested i can i have already shared it with uh, professor mondal and if you are interested you can take a look at yes any question so thank you sir uh, for your nice talk and uh, you have elaborately uh, give the ideas about the calculations of the waveguides and uh, the propagations of the lights through the waveguides and how it can be uh, made very well for the uh, high speed photo detector uh, with the help of the 35 semiconductor so uh, this session is now open for the questions so if you have any questions please ask to professor dash so next sessions uh, will be started by professor nunji so before starting i'll introduce about himself so please wait so <clears throat> about professor nunji so he is a uh, uh, he is a professor from uh, canadian university so uh, his field of specializations is experimental 
condensed matter physics and optics and his research area is optical and electronic properties of organic materials and devices and chiral photonics and solar uh, solar cells and about his educations so uh, educations and experience so he was so he has the research awards uh, the research professors at the nanomaterials research and research institute in kaohsiung university chinese academic of science visiting professorship for senior international scientist and uh, he was the adjacent professor in moscow engineering physics institute he was adjacent professor physics royal military college of canada and he was tier 1 canada research chair in photonics for life 2013 fellow of the institute of physics iop and distinguished visiting professor at university of fukuoka december 2012 visiting professor at university of henry and uh, uh, in july 2000 2012 and board member of the university club 2010 tier 1 canadian research chair in chiral photonics in 2006 and he has published more than 398 plus journals and uh, more conference uh, 185 more conference papers so with this short introduction i will request to professor nunji to start his uh, lecture sir please Thank you, Dr. Mondal, for uh, the nice introduction. So, uh, this morning in Canada today. So, good morning, uh, everybody. So, like our uh, the introduction of uh, Dr. Mondal, like Dr. Mondal said, I am uh, in Canada at Queen's University. Queen's University is in Ontario. It is uh, not a big university. The city is located in between Montreal and uh, and Toronto, and it is 150,000 uh, uh, inhabitants uh, city. And uh, I will speak about uh, advanced nanostructure, uh, perovskite, graphene, plasmonic photodetectors, and sensors. And uh, the work is done in collaboration with uh, several uh, several other colleagues and uh, and friends. Dr. Lebel at uh, Royal Military College, uh, Dr. Seroud at Queen's University, Dr. El Ganawi in uh, Lorraine, Dr. Taima and uh, Shahid Shahid Uzaman uh, Sohel who spoke uh, in the morning. Uh, yes, in the morning in India uh, at University of Kanazawa, Dr. Tamiv, also who is a member of that uh, Spark project on uh, on sensors uh, from uh, the Russian Academy of Science in Moscow, uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Kislyakov in uh, Shanghai uh, Shanghai University of uh, Shanghai Academy of Science, and uh, Dr. Lazizil in. Uh, in the uh, university of uh, mohammed mohammed 5 in uh, rabat in morocco and uh, in my team we have some uh, i i am working with some graduate students uh, broyo rana rana puchimin and uh, some uh, master students as well and some visiting students plus uh, undergrad i will not enumerate all of them but uh, we are um, we are a dozen including the undergraduate students in the team So the reason why I uh, present that uh, lecture is uh, is related to a need that uh, we have uh, in uh, in the industry in the modern industry with the development of uh, of uh, robots and uh, and the machine we need to develop some uh, advanced vision and the vision shouldn't be doesn't have to be limited to the characteristics of uh, human vision which is limited to the visible range and has only three different colors and doesn't distinguish polarization uh, detectors can do that so we i will uh, speak about some uh, concepts which can allow uh, an advanced vision similar to what happens in nature with the mantis shrimp as a mantis shrimp is a, is a small animal not exactly a shrimp but uh, it's a, it's a marine uh, marine uh, animal uh, which has a, a complex vision with more than uh, with about 20 16 types of uh, uv visible uh, receptors that means the shrimp can distinguish uh, 16 different kind of uh, colors and uh, also which is able to distinguish polarization linear polarization but also right and left circular polarizations so to do this photodetectors already we have uh, started working with uh, 
Kanazawa University in a partnership. Uh, part of the work is done uh, at Queen's, part is done <coughs> in the University of Kanazawa. So I just recall a little bit the perovskite solar cells because uh, uh, this is the, the one of the advanced photodetectors we use. We use different kind of materials, by the way, but uh, I will not speak about everything, of course. Uh, so the perovskite material is a structure which is ABX3. Uh, a cubic uh, lattice. It can have different kind of lattice, by the way, but uh, the cubic one is the one that has uh, the desired absorption and uh, mobility, essentially. Uh, and then we have to engineer the interfaces, inter engineer the engineering the interfaces and the crystal lattice with the right conformation. It requires a lot of work. And, uh, and for instance, I was just showing some uh, images on the top right. Uh, uh, extracted from a review paper on the, on the tuning of the electron transport, electron injection layer uh, using metal oxide and in, uh, in this kind of uh, materials, which requires a lot of work. I didn't develop too much because uh, I think that uh, Dr. Shaidu Zaman has already developed. The efficiency of perovskite has been uh, skyrocketing uh, recently at uh, 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 above, above 25%. Although it started uh, in 2009 at uh, a kind of uh, low low efficiency of 3.8% uh, with uh, pioneer, pioneering researchers from uh, Professor Miyazaka in Japan. Um, with, uh, with a team with uh, Kanazawa University, we have been working uh, a lot on the, like I was saying, on the, on the engineering of the interfaces. And uh, that's a result of uh, the engineering of uh, the anatase phase of uh, titanium dioxide, which is used like a, an electron transport, electron injection layer, uh, which uh, after tuning, so this, this is a, a, TEM a, a TEM image from the side of the, of the perovskite uh, structure, in which you see the top uh, anatase layer, which is deposited on, the, on top of, uh, of a thick, titanium dioxide layer, and which allows the growth of uh, larger crystals, as well as the growth of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a, a better contacted perovskite material onto the interface, and uh, allows to increase the open circuit voltage and, uh, and the efficiency by, by consequences. Uh, the open circuit voltage is increased for uh, different reasons, but the main reason is that it uh, that anatase layer will uh, reduce the, the leakage current in the in the in the solar cell. We have been also working on the deposition of the material itself uh, using uh, ionic liquids. That's a specialty of uh, of uh, Dr. Shahid Zaman. The deposition of uh, perovskite materials starting from uh, from uh, ionic liquids, and uh, these ionic liquids are uh, have plenty of uh, advantage. But I will say that uh, one characteristic is that they are hydrophobic uh, and um, so despite increasing the size of the crystals by the seeding process which is important for the charge diffusion in solar cells they uh, create some uh, they, they reinforce an hydrophobic character of the perovskite which uh, increases its stability stability in uh, room air conditions and uh, that's very desirable for uh, for solar cells to to improve the stability because if we don't do the the process with the ionic liquids the the properties disappear after a short period of time a few hours like uh, i mean a couple several, several days i would say uh, a few days like after 10 days you don't have any more uh, efficiencies uh, meanwhile uh, meanwhile if you if you use uh, ionic liquid preparation the stability is increased to to what to to very reasonable values uh, we work on different aspects on these perovskite materials, and uh, the important thing also with perovskite, to, with respect to the to the topic of the of the lecture I'm delivering, is that the band gap can be tuned by tuning the different parameters like the composition by uh, replacing the iodine in the methyl ammonium lead iodide by uh, substituting the the iodine the halogen by uh, other kind of halogens like bromine or chloride, the band gap can be shifted from the near infrared at uh, 1.5 electron volts uh, up to the to the to, to the green range, 
at uh, green, 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 blue at about two electron volts, which is very desirable for uh, for detectors. And the properties of uh, absorption of the of the solar cell can be calculated using uh, using optics. And uh, this is what we have uh, been doing with, uh, with my colleague uh, Alex Tamev at the Russian Academy of Science. We have in that paper, we have uh, compared. Yes. Uh, if you have question, maybe we will have a question at the end of uh, the lecture. No, we have not. Hello, uh, hi. Okay. Uh, so we can tune the property. We can tune and calculate. I'm sorry, uh, is it possible to, to mute the microphone? Is it possible to mute the microphone because it, uh, it has some interferences with my uh, presentation? So, uh, the spectral response can be predicted by uh, calculus and, uh, and also by tuning the thickness of the solar cells. And the spectral response uh, being uh, calculated in that way uh, match the, the experiment. And this is what we have uh, demonstrated in the attached paper. All these uh, materials can be can be tuned by uh, tuning the thickness, by tuning the composition, and by using some uh, some filters. So multicolor detectors can be realized with a perovskite solar cells. But uh, I will uh, I will not develop on all the kind of detectors uh, which can be realized using perovskite solar cells. We have reviewed them in a paper uh, in a paper published uh, at uh, IEEE Sensor Journal uh, like one year ago. And uh, I will move on with uh, other type of uh, photo detectors. So, uh, like photodetectors, we can also use uh, graphene, not the graphene like uh, uh, plain graphene, because the absorption of graphene is uh, small, so we can uh, uh, modify the graphene. What we have done is uh, the use of uh, graphene like a photodetector in a configuration which is a field effect transistor. So I introduced this one because it's uh, we, we are working on the sensors with, uh, with, uh, with Dr. Mondal at uh, Durgapur. And uh, I'm showing this one, uh, which is taken from literature. The graphene is a material with uh, with a with a, uh, a band gap that is uh, that is closed, which is a metal uh, with a, with a divergence at the at the Fermi level, which is called uh, a direct point, uh, in which the density of state is uh, is uh, is turning to to almost zero. And uh, and the, the properties, the conductivity of the graphene can be shifted very easily owing to that property, uh, owing to that particular band structure. The conductivity of the graphene can be shifted just by applying a voltage or any interaction on top of the graphene can shift the Fermi level into the valence band or into the conduction band that you can create a, a semiconductor starting from a conductor from a, from a metal. Uh, you, can, you can create a, a semiconductor which will be p-type or n-type depending on the on the gate voltage or on the interaction on top of the surface, which allowed recently to fabricate uh, for for a team to the publication that I'm showing here to fabricate some uh, COVID sensors because of obviously the interaction of the of the surface ligands on top of the graphene will be affected by the binding. To some uh, to some uh, uh, some uh, molecules, and in particular, they could detect the spike protein of uh, of the COVID virus. So we have incorporated the, the graphene into field effect transistor. Uh, the technique is not so complicated. We can purchase uh, monolayer graphene from uh, from different companies. This one we purchased in a, in a company that is located in uh, in Spain, and uh, the monolayer graphene is a kind of a large flake which is deposited on a substrate of uh, two inch of uh, silicon oxidized silicon and uh, the silicon is a, is, a, is a silicon so it's a conductor semiconductor doped semiconductor and that can be used like a gate for a transistor so the graphene being deposited on top of the of the, of the silicon uh, we deposit electrodes, gold electrodes, using a mask that is pictured on the figure A in that uh, diapositive, in that, in that page. 
uh, the the square that you see here is just uh, one square centimeter and the total substrate that you that you see uh, that you see is just cut from the from the wafer which is silicon that's why the cut is is very sharp because the silicon is an oriented crystal and uh, having deposited the the electrode these electrodes will be used like uh, source and drain for the for the field effect transistor and uh, we deposit some nanoparticles to, to 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 create an absorption because the absorption of uh, of uh, neat monolayer graphene is uh, very small like uh, like a few percent four percent typically and uh, it's not sufficient to have an efficient photo detector so the quantum dots especially lead sulfide quantum dots uh, are able to extend the absorption to the to the new infrared uh, depending on the size of course because they are quantum dots with quantum confinement and uh, we, pr we pr produce a ligand exchange from the oleic acid uh, ligands, which are uh, available by defect during the fabrication of the, of the lead, lead sulfide. So these are oleic acid ligands. We substitute them by uh, perovskite ligands, perovskite ligands, which can be uh, methyl ammonium or, uh, or uh, form a medium ammonium, uh, form a medium uh, to fabricate some photo transistor. So the assembling is shown uh, on the bottom, bottom left, and you see the crystals uh, of uh, from microscopy image, high resolution, in which you can see kind of clearly the crystals and the lattice of the, of the uh, lead sulfide, which uh, changes when you we practice the ligand exchange. So we study different kind of ligand exchanges, uh, wet processing, dry processing, and like I was explaining, uh, when we when we dope by applying uh, a voltage to the gate or by just uh, making an interaction, when we dope the graphene, the graphene becomes uh, a semiconductor, which can be depending on the on the gate voltage. If the gate voltage is uh, is positive, you will have uh, n-type semiconductor in which the Fermi level will jump up. And if we create, if we apply uh, a negative voltage, we create a p-type. Uh, kind of uh, conduction into the graphene, QP type semiconductor. And uh, this can be shifted by uh, illumination as well, because when we illuminate the quantum dots, the quantum dots uh, extract uh, electron hole pairs. And uh, actually, the, the, the hole will go into the, into the graphene. The graphene will accept the hole versus the energy of the lead sulfide, which means that the, the graphene will be p-doped under these conditions. And uh, then sending light creates uh, creates conductivity into the into the graphene, and this is pictured in the top right. Uh, depending on the on the ligands uh, using methyl ammonium iodide, uh, lead iodide, we we have some photoconductivity, and the photoconductivity so the photodetector is increased using uh, formamidinium uh, lead iodide ligands. Uh, here I picture the absorption of the of the photodetectors, of the quantum dots, in fact, which is uh, pointing in the 1.3 uh, nanometer wavelengths. So the quantum dots create uh, an infrared sensitivity, uh, which can be tuned, obviously, with the size of the quantum dots, or with the nature of the quantum dots. By tuning the quantum dots into other quantum dots, we can also tune the absorbance into different wavelengths ranges. We were interested in the infrared in that uh, in that work, and, uh, and there we compare the, the difference happening between uh, uh, a solid state ligand exchange versus a liquid state ligand exchange, solid uh, SPE, solid phase yeah. exchange, or LPE, liquid phase exchange, and, uh, and the response is huh? in the case of uh, the liquid phase exchange, while the solid phase exchange gives uh, a uh, response which is amplified. And the reason, again, as we could analyze by, uh, by microscopy, is related to the, to the assembling of the quantum dots on top of the surface of the graphene. In the case of the solid phase exchange, we have uh, a dense packing of uh, quantum dots. And in the case of the liquid phase exchange, we have uh, a packing with uh, plenty of uh, defects which affect the, the, the photo response as well as the uh, the photoconductivity, because the photo response is the photoconductivity of the photodetectors. These are uh, IV, 
actually it's a VG, uh, I, would, I could say transfer carriage. Uh, no, it's IV curves, it's uh, uh, IV curves of the photodetector, so it is uh, source drain current versus uh, versus uh, the source drain voltage of the photodetector. I will see it shows the transfer characteristics in the next transparency. The transfer characteristics look like uh, it is expected. That means that when we we tune the the voltage of the the gate voltage of the of the transistor, we can uh, cancel the conductivity of the of the phototransistor uh, by applying a voltage which is sufficient to to neutralize the the, the photoconductor which was uh, doped by uh, by the quantum dots under the action of light. And uh, if you would have continued the, the, to increase the, the gate voltage to positive values, we would have had again some conductivity, but then uh, uh, n-type conductivity instead of the p-type conductivity, which is showed in that uh, in that uh, figure on the on the right of the of the transparency. We also we also did some uh, different kind of uh, ligand exchanges. To study the to study the photoconductivity of the of the graphene of the quantum dot uh, graphene photodetector, and uh, it appears that by uh, substituting the the halogen into the perovskite, like I was saying, we can substitute the halogen to modify the property of the, per the perovskite. So here they are used like uh, ligands, so that the, the conductivity is not related. The photoconductivity is not related to the perovskite per se. But the perovskite is contributing to the arrangement, to the ordering of the lattice of uh, quantum dots on top of the graphene. And by substituting the, the, the iodine by uh, bromine, we can improve the, the packing of the quantum dots and improve the, the photoconductivity of the photoconductors. That being said, I will move to another kind of uh, photodetectors. Uh, I'm checking, yes, the time should be compatible. Uh, I will move to another type of photodetectors, which is based on uh, plasmonics, because uh, uh, plasmonics, which are a resonance of the cloud of, uh, of uh, a coupling of the motion of the electron cloud in, uh, in metals uh, to the electromagnetic field. They are polaritons, if you want, coupled excitations, uh, in which the, the electron cloud is uh, following the movement of the, of the electric field. Of the light at the uh, speed at which the electric field shifts, that means at, uh, at 10 to the 15 hertz, almost. Uh, the, there are different kind of plasmons. There are surface plasmons in which uh, there is need to couple the the light with some preservation of the momentum. So it's possible to couple the light, preserving the momentum using gratings or prisms. But in the case of uh, localized surface plasmons. That uh, that is not necessary because they are small enough, the nanoparticles to 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 tolerate all the k vectors mismatch with uh, with light, so momentum conservation becomes cancelled at, uh, at uh, momentum conservation of the optical light is cancelled uh, for that kind of size of nanoparticles which are in the range of uh, 20 nanometers to 50 nanometers, uh, typical range up to 100 eventually. Uh, so we can couple the excitation directly and uh, the plasmons oscillate like dipoles uh, in phase opposition to the light, which has consequences on the, on the emission near the, the metal, which can be either amplified for, uh, for dipoles which are parallel to the excitation and, or cancelled for dipoles which are uh, perpendicular to the, to the excitation, depending on the, on the ordering of the dipoles on the surface. But that can be used for uh, also for scattering because uh, as the, the the nanoparticles are uh, excited by the plasmonic resonance, which can be calculated from the mis scattering theory, uh, there is uh, there is an enhancement of the absorbance. But then having some absorbance, some losses by the Joule effect of the electrons into the into the the particles. That loss can be can be bad if we want to study some uh, some solar cells, so it is better if we want to fabricate some photodetectors to use these uh, nanoparticles with a larger size, because like the miscattering theory predicts, the the scattering is increasing like the square of the volume of the nanoparticles. Meanwhile, the absorption is increasing naturally like the volume of the nanoparticles, which is related to the number of electrons. So by increasing the size of the nanoparticles, 
it is possible to favor the scattering, which then can be used for, uh, for solar cells, interestingly. And uh, this is just an example of, uh, of a realization in which uh, uh, my students in my team developed some uh, nanoparticles by uh, different methods. This was uh, silver nanoparticles, which were uh, prepared in, uh, in a solution. On the, on the top, on the right, uh, just uh, figure B, if you want the one close to the electron microscope. This is a transmission electron microscopy image. And uh, this is just the size distribution, which shows that the size uh, range is around uh, 40 nanometers with some, uh, some jitter, and that's uh, what the histogram tells. And uh, you see that the absorption is, uh, is quite broad. Uh, already, the absorption is broad enough to, to actually, it's not just the absorption, it is the, the negative log uh, 10 of the transmission. So it includes absorption, which is a loss, and the scattering, which is just a dissipation owing to, to the relics, to the scattering from the nanoparticles, because they are big enough to interact with the light. And uh, these nanoparticles were incorporated into a zinc oxide uh, nanoparticle layer, which is used for uh, electron collection in uh, organic solar cells. So we built an electron, an organic solar cells on top of this uh, zinc oxide, uh, zinc oxide layer modified with uh, nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles. And uh, that increases the, the efficiency, like you can see on the IV curves, in which the efficiency is the area of the rectangles that you can draw below the, below the current voltage characteristics. Uh, the efficiency is just related to the area. So the larger the area, the larger uh, the efficiency. And that efficiency can be related also to the absorbance of the light. It is uh, definitely proportional to it. And uh, the light absorbance has been increased by using the nanoparticles uh, on top of, uh, on, at the bottom of the solar cells, actually. But this is an inverted structure in which the light is going from the glass. So that when, when I say on top, it's from the entrance of the light. So the light is going from by the bottom in that figure, which is uh, just a, a layout, a diagram of, uh, of the different layers that were deposited by uh, wet processing and uh, dry processing. The molybden oxide and the silver are deposited by vacuum sublimation. Sequentially, uh, and the absorbance has been uh, the absorbance actually is the equivalent uh, quantum efficiency, the external quantum efficiency of the solar cell has been increased significantly. Uh, I say this one because it's more related to scattering. The absorbance do not show any peak like uh, expected, any particular peak. It's just a little bit increased versus uh, when the nanoparticles are incorporated into the zinc oxide layer, like the blue curve shows here. Uh, these nanoparticles can be used for uh, different topics. Uh, they can, uh, when I show the nanoparticles like this, they can uh, modify the light during to the, to the plasmonic interaction, creating a polariton, uh, that coupled state of, uh, of uh, electron motion and, uh, and the dipole, dipole uh, excitation of the light. But it can also, uh, it can also the, the, the gold or uh, silver are metals, noble metals. It can also extract electrons by uh, just the, 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 the wiggling of the Fermi level under the, the action of the light. When the cloud of electron oscillates around, around the nanoparticle, electrons can be ejected. They are called hot electrons. And it's possible to use them for uh, photodetection. And I will show this because it has some uh, interesting features. Uh, that uh, hot electron emission. And uh, on the left of that image is uh, not nanoparticles, but some uh, clusters of uh, gold deposited by uh, vacuum sublimation, by uh, deposition under a vacuum, just heating gold, uh, up to an equivalent thickness of 14 nanometers. It's not 14 nanometers per se. The mass of the deposited material would have corresponded to 14 nanometers if it would have been a uniform layer. I mean, that's a measurement of the, of the quartz control during the vacuum deposition process. By depositing a 14 nanometer thick gold on top of uh, indium tin oxide, because we want to have a conducting substrate, a transparent conducting substrate, so indium tin oxide deposited on top of gold, the gold self-assembles like uh, this kind of clusters 
when the sub provided the substrate is uh, heated at uh, about uh, 100 Celsius, not more than this, not needed during the, the vacuum deposition process. And provided the vacuum deposition process is uh, done at uh, slow enough speed, uh, that is called black gold. Black gold is not uh, our discovery. It exists since uh, since a long period of time, probably in the uh, 1970 something. And uh, that uh, so-called black gold shows uh, a very broad absorption into the into the near infrared, like uh, you can see on the right of that uh, image. The left absorption that you see is a little bump that you have uh, around 500 nanometers is a regular surface, localized surface plasma mode of, of gold uh, deposited on the interface. It's not uh, really in air, it's uh, deposited on top of the ITO, but it's uh, not so affected by the ITO. This is a, a transverse vibration, if you want, it's an oscillation which is perpendicular, perpendicular to, the, to the surface of the film. So it's like uh, an, uh, an electric field which is perpendicular to the image that you see uh, in that figure. But if there is, a, if you if you look at the transverse excitation, so there, uh, at the longitudinal excitation, sorry, the one that is in the plane of the film, you have an excitation which involves different uh, different clusters. So different clusters oscillate like uh, like dipole. Uh, so they don't physically exchange the charge; they exchange the dipolar energy from the electro electromagnetic field. And uh, owing to the quasi 2D fractal structure. Uh, of the deposition process, we have a very broad absorption because there is disorder into the into the arrangement of the nano clusters, and you see that broad absorption that uh, spans from uh, typically 700 nanometers to the near infrared at uh, 1.6 microns, and uh, we have been using it at uh, 1.5 microns using a laser at 1.5 microns by uh, fabricating a, a capacitor. So we have the capacitor is pictured on the left. We have the ITO deposited on top of glass, on which we deposit the gold thin film, like you've seen in the in the scanning electron microscopy image that I was showing just right now. And then we use a spacer. In that case, the spacer was uh, 60 microns. It's the same spacer as used for uh, solar cells, uh, dye sensitized solar cells. We can have different thicknesses of uh, of spacers, and we fabricate a capacitor by uh, just. Uh, oh, Professor Nundi, the slide is not moving. The slide is not moving. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Is this still showing the 14 slide number 14 we are seeing? LSPR uh, slide. Do I change the slide now? No, slide number is still is not moving yet. Uh, which number do you have? Uh, now we have, we can see only num slide number 14. LSPR 14. slide, yes. Okay, because uh, I was, normally it should be 16, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yes, now it's come 18. Oh, you see 18. So yes, I will return to the I will return to the 17. Okay, sorry I'm about sorry, that. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, sorry. Oh, that's certainly a lagging of the of the network. It's too slow. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, sorry. I'm sorry for sorry to interrupt. Sorry. <laughs> that's nice. That's a very very important because I wanted to show the. So I discussed. Uh, because I, I've been discussing the 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 absorbance of the of the of the gold, so the the 14 nanometer thick gold creates the structure that we see by uh, scanning electron microscopy on the left, which has a, an absorption, a very broad absorption spanning uh, the the near infrared from uh, down to to to, to less than uh, than one electron volt down to 1.6 microns actually. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, material is uh, called in the literature black gold. Uh, so it's really black because it's a very broad band absorber in which the absorbance in the near, uh, in the visible is related to, a, to, a, trans, to a, a transverse mode, which is perpendicular to the surface of the gold film. And uh, the one is infrared is, uh, is, a, is a longitudinal absorption, which is uh, parallel to the film, lying into the film. So there is a polarization of the absorption. That's what I wanted to stress. So we fabricate capacitors with uh, we can use different uh, thickness of, uh, of spacers in the capacitor. The picture on the left here is a picture of the capacitor with uh, two ITO plates 
uh, sandwich, sandwiched uh, with a sandwiching just a spacer. So it's an air capacitor in that situation. And it's totally transparent because the film of gold of 14 nanometers is black, but uh, the, uh, the net absorbance is not very big, like uh, like shown here. You can have an absorbance up to up to almost uh, one in the near infrared, but in the visible, the absorbance is 0 0.3. It's at 3 dB. It's uh, it's uh, uh, 0 0.3 absorbance. Yes, 3 dB. It's just 15% uh, of uh, of transmission, so it's not a lot of absorbance in the in the visible. That's why you see only a shadow on that image of uh, lotus flowers. It's just for decoration, but oh. Uh, but the shadow is a is a is a detector that uh, that we have here. Uh, so uh, when we send the light, uh, the light from the from a, from a laser at 1.5 micron, we have a, a photo voltage that is created into the capacitor because the electrons are extracted from the gold to move into the into the ITO, and that creates a polarization which is uh, detectable under under shopped light. We don't. That's not uh, uh, in that situation. It is. Uh, it has a time response of a few milliseconds, but that uh, experiment is done uh, under shopped light. So the light is shopped, and we use a locking amplifier to to make the detection in the figures that you see photoresponsivity at 1.5 microns. Uh, uh, one, yes, 1.5 microns. So to modify the, the absorbance and to check the ability of the of the whole extraction, but by hot electron emission. We use the layer of uh, polymer which can be oriented on top. The layer of uh, polymer can be oriented and we check that by uh, second harmonic generation, which second harmonic generation with that kind of material actually is not a polymer, it's a molecular glass. It is very stable under illumination. Uh, here it's an illumination for uh, for uh, several hours, like a few days, and we see that the intensity of the second harmonic generation is uh, is not affected. Actually, that the, this one is the square root of the intensity of the of the second harmonic generation. It is a normalized uh, uh, coupling coefficient, which is d three three d three d three three in that situation, which uh, doesn't uh, which is not affected. D three three is polarized perpendicular to the film. Uh, which is not affected by uh, by time under illumination under light. So these molecules were uh, these azo glasses were oriented by uh, electric field polling, and uh, by the electric field polling we can orient the dipoles pointing to the surface or pointing out of the surface, which affects the hot electron emission. In that figure, you see the hot electron emission, the photovoltage actually, the photovoltage from the capacitor, which uh, the first thing you can notice, it depends on the polarization angle. So we rotate the polarization, the polarization uh, sent to the sample is uh, linear, the sample is slanted versus the uh, direction of the laser. So we send, uh, it is slanted, it's not uh, perpendicular to the, to the K vector of the laser, of the laser beam. And when we rotate the polarization, we can have a polarization which is uh, uh, perpendicular to the film or parallel to the film, which will be called either uh, P polarization or S polarization. When we are in the S polarization at uh, 45 degrees, for the 45 degrees is just the optical axis of the of the half wave plate at 1.5 micron, which was uh, used to turn the linear polarization of the laser. When the polarization is uh, in the plane, S polarization, we have typically uh, more, uh, like 30% uh, more uh, photoelectron emission than when it is lying perpendicular, pointing out of the plane, like P polarization, which uh, which is predicted using uh, the, some nonlinear optical coefficient, like uh, like uh, chi three, if we want to describe the process. But it's predicted by uh, by the interaction uh, under study. And uh, it is due to the fact that the, the mode that is absorbing the light and extracting the electron is a mode that is polarized into the plane, that is a mode that is uh, absorbing at 1.5 microns technically. But the more striking uh, thing is that when we deposit the layer of molecular glass on top of the, of the gold film, we don't have any variation of the hot electron emission. Meanwhile, when we orient it with the dipoles pointing out of the, uh, towards the film, towards the gold film, 
when we orient it toward, with the dipoles toward the golf we have an increase of the hot electron emission by a factor of uh, almost uh, three also, uh, by almost three. Uh, when we orient it in the right direction. Meanwhile, when you orient the dipoles pointing out of uh, of the of the gold film, then we point pointing sorry towards the gold film. This one is pointing out of the gold film. This one is pointing towards the gold film. Then we have a reduction of the hot electron emission. And uh, this is pictured uh, typically. The effect is pictured here. The the reason is that there is. Uh, there is a barrier, a triangular barrier at the contact between the gold and the ITO because they don't have the same uh, the same uh, work function. The work function of gold is like uh, 4.1 eV. Meanwhile, the work function of the ITO is uh, is uh, is close to 4.8 eV, so uh, 5.1 eV. So there is a difference of uh, typically 0.3 eV which uh, creates when the two are in contact, the two Fermi levels will be aligned, but uh, it still creates a triangular barrier, which triangular barrier will be changed if we assemble a layer of dipoles on top of the surface, because then the dipoles uh, shift the vacuum level of the gold, and uh, by shifting the vacuum level of the gold, the triangular barrier is reduced, and the injection can be modeled by injection through a triangular barrier, which is a typical fuller nordheim theory. So this is what happens, which was published uh, a little bit ago. So we can tune the hot electron emission by creating a rectification due to the alignment of the dipoles. Uh, <clears throat> Other kind of photodetectors, uh, I heard the first lecture this morning about uh, sustainability and, uh, and uh, into the airplane industry. And uh, people are interested in, uh, in, uh, in vision, in uh, context, which is, uh, of course, uh, involving the space exploration. And uh, for space exploration, especially if you try to figure out uh, exploration of Mars, a lot is done by robots, of, co of course. Uh, it's complicated to send humans, and uh, at least robots can do the job. But uh, one main difficulty with, uh, with a planet uh, which is outer of the, of the Earth orbit is that it can be uh, hidden by uh, by the sun, part of uh, the martial, martian year, or part of the also Earth year. Uh, the the two planets can be in uh, in opposition versus the sun, which uh, forbids direct communications. So communications uh, must be must involve a set of uh, of satellites, and uh, to communicate with satellites which has distance such as the orbit of a planet, uh, light. Uh, is a good way of communication. So people are developing some uh, light communication systems uh, to transmit information and uh, image and uh, all kind of uh, uh, sensors response uh, through space using light. So then things become interesting because the light is uh, quite powerful and uh, that powerful light, we use, they use laser light because the divergence of laser light is, uh, is of course less than the divergence of uh, just uh, regular emission. Uh, which divergence would be would require uh, very powerful uh, emitting stations. Meanwhile, using laser, uh, there is a lot of saving of light, technically, of energy to, to facilitate the communication. The, the tricky thing would be the pointing, but uh, it's possible to fabricate uh, automatic pointing using just the response from uh, from the light that is bouncing back and forth from the mirrors, like uh, like aligning uh, missiles, technically. They can be aligned also by using a shopped light, a kind of lidar process, and uh, and in the same way the, the light can be transmitted. But then using light for communication, light also can be processed uh, in a detector in a, in a smart way, like a smart detector, and this uh, pushed us to revisit some uh, concepts of uh, nonlinear optics uh, related to bistability. Bistability is a control of light by light in which uh, light is intense enough in a resonance system, which uh, resonance system creates a memory to, to fabricate the switching like, in, a, like in, a, in, in an electronic memory, just it's uh, induced by light. You can imagine a fabri perot cavity with a, with a Q factor, which, is, uh, which has to be large enough, let's say, uh, to create some resonance. And uh, in such conditions, when you send an intense light, the light uh, is more intense inside the cavity, of course, creates a, a non which is called N2, the non index of refraction, 
which can either increase or reduce the index of refraction, but then it shifts the resonance of the fabry perrot The resonance of the fabry perrot is an airy function like pictured on that uh, figure. And uh, by uh, tuning the light, it's possible to create a bistable loop. And this is what we implemented with a resonant cavity fabricated from uh, the deposition of uh, different layers of polymers, high index polymer and low index polymer, and uh, polyvinyl alcohol and uh, polyvinyl carbazol. One has a low index, the polyvinyl alcohol, and the polyvinyl carbazol has an index in the range of 1.6, which is uh, way larger than the polyvinyl alcohol. Uh, some graphene was incorporated into the polyvinyl, uh, polyvinyl alcohol, uh, graphene by uh, suspension, graphene nanoflakes. And, uh, and under these conditions, we have uh, fabry perot resonance, uh, which is shown in that picture. These are experimental data of the fabry perot of the fabry perot transmission of a different kind of fabry perot with 14 or 20 layers, including C60 or graphene. So we use different uh, different materials. When you are on the on the right wing of the resonance, let's take a resonance like uh, this uh, purple one. When you are on the right wing, on the low energy side of the resonance, this corresponds to the to the band gap, the low energy part of the band gap, in which the light uh, gets uh, concentrated into the high index material. When you are on the high energy side of the of the band gap, because it's a photonic structure, so it has a band gap. Uh, when you are on the high energy side of the band gap, then the light is uh, is more concentrated on the on the low index of refraction, low dielectric constant material of the photonic crystal. These are properties of photonic crystals, and uh, and and then we can probe. For instance, in that experiment, we are probing at uh, 1.06 microns, so which is more like on the left side of the photonic crystal. And uh, this allows to have the light confined into the index material, which is uh, graphene, by the way. And then we could study at the different uh, ranges of uh, pulses from femtosecond, uh, using femtosecond laser, using a nanosecond laser, and using a CW laser with a chopper to make it uh, quasi-continuous. We could use different, uh, develop different kind of uh, non-linearities and uh, which are uh, uh, summarized in that uh, in that table here uh, on the on the top right and on the bottom right what you see is the interaction of uh, the continuous wave laser with uh, with a photonic crystal in which the laser shifts on and off owing to the extra cavity which is actually the nonlinear mirror the, the photonic crystal acts in the band gap when you're at the band gap where the transmission is reduced the photonic crystal becomes a reflector, like you see actually the, the colors here are not colors. These colors are not colors of the materials that contain the photonic crystal because the graphene concentration is very small. These are interferometric colors owing to the resonance that you see in the visible here. The resonance depending the, the graphene, the PC1, PC2, PC3, depending the composition uh, is shifted between uh, 500 and 600 nanometers and gives that uh, this nice, uh, these nice uh, colors of the material. So we can fabricate some uh, switching devices, uh, which will be useful for the next generation of uh, satellite communications. And uh, I will thank you all. This is a picture of my team during the pandemic, so we could not meet. Uh, we are returning to real meetings and uh, probably next next lecture, I will show some, uh, some pictures taken recently from uh, my full team. Thank you very much.